గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ భరతన్ మాస్టర్ గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ అండి గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ మీ అందరం ఇక్కడ కొంతమంది మా వాళ్ళందరూ గ్యాదర్ అయ్యారు అండ్ మై ప్రిన్సిపల్ హూ ఈ స్టేయింగ్ ఎట్ సిడ్నీ ఎట్ ప్రెసెంట్ నౌ హీస్ ఆల్సో ఆన్ ద లైన్ ఓకే అండ్ షెల్ వి స్టార్ట్ నౌ సర్ yes i am ready you are ready thank you sir thank you so today we are going to start an annual webinar uh, the topic is recent trends in drug discovery a role of spectroscopy and computational tools 2022 before starting the webinar the today's speaker is professor prasad v patan garu he is a senior professor in naipur mohali and uh, before starting his talk uh, i'll read out his cv and before that our senior most professor professor vai raj rajendra prasad garu is going to give uh, opening remark of this webinar sir are you on the line yeah 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 please sir so, please tell us the chemistry department and all the details about the webinar sir so good morning everybody good morning sir so uh, they can't see i am only responding on your side sir good morning sir good morning. is it audible good morning sir yes sir is it it's audible yeah yeah so i am very happy to see professor bharatam vs prasad I believe he was in Andhra University a few years ago, if I am right. He was working at Bits Kalani at that time. No, no, I was always at Naipur only. I came to... I came to yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, welcome you, sir, uh, to this national webinar. And Thank also you. I welcome my colleagues, uh, Professor Girija Shankar. Girija Shastri, Isar Kumar, Marali Krishna Kumar, Pawar and Shailaja, all are here, I believe. Uh, at the outset, I take this opportunity to congratulate and appreciate my colleague, Professor Girija Shastri, uh, for taking this initiative to organize a two-day national webinar on recent trends in drug discovery a role of spectroscopy and computational tools uh for the benefit of the so many participants who joined online the andhra university college of pharmaceutical sciences at visakhapatnam is the second oldest in the country after banaras hindu university starting pharmacy education in india and uh, the founder head of the department was professor s rangaswamy uh, who came to visakhapatnam along with uh, professor t r seshadri the option is it audible madam yes sir yes it is audible sir 
it is all right yeah he came out to visakhapatnam from chennai along with professor t r seshadri a very uh, powerful chemist in those days he was the apparel who did his doctoral work under rabinson the noble laureate and uh, professor rangaswamy also went to university of basel to carry out his post doctoral studies under the noble laureate uh, professor t r rackstein who has done a lot of work on uh, steroids and particularly on cardiac arrhythmia so he came back to online university initiated research on cardiac arrhythmia and to tell you today andhra university pharmaceutical chemistry laboratory is the first one to discover a new cardiac arrhythmia pervoside from tvtia nerifolia and later came the drug discovery from harikishan singh in the form of chandonium iodide which is a synthetic molecule uh, apart from these two molecules uh, to the best of my knowledge all the molecules they claim today they are neither pure compounds nor being used at all so the spirocide still being used in italy uh, for congestive heart failure like desoxin in most of the countries why i am telling you all this is the college of pharmaceutical sciences uh, you need to be very strong in research uh, particularly in the natural products uh, along with the neighboring chemistry department uh, with the uh, great work from tr seshadri lr rao and other people so coming to the topic uh, the recent trends in drug discovery you know i always believe pharmaceutical sciences or pharmacy is an ever changing science of drugs an ever changing science of drugs so is the case the drug discovery also the drug discovery is also an ever changing uh, aspect you can it cannot be always the one which we have carried out some 40 years back or 50 years back uh, based on some blind screening or by accident or serendipitous discovery all these things uh, it has undergone tremendous refinement uh, with the changes taking place in medical chemistry uh, so we have to update our knowledge uh, with the changing times and uh, the national webinar will take note of such changes for the benefit of the students and the faculty and i am very happy to have with us today professor prasad v bharatam who will be speaking on pharmaco informatics including artificial intelligence so a very new topic you have seen so many informatics chemoinformatics bioinformatics and again in the bioinformatics more specific on the pharmaco informatics which may be more precise in drug discovery compared to bioinformatics so all this requires uh, the assistance of artificial intelligence also to hasten in the process of uh, the drug discovery which is a very novel concept i hope you all will be benefited uh, from this and again we have dr akela vijay sharma who will be speaking on basic principles of nmr spectroscopy i believe he is from indian institute of chemical technology uh, you know the nmr spectroscopy is really very useful not only to understand the basic principles but a very useful tool in drug discovery in drug discovery we can modify the uh, drugs by taking the x ray crystallography and then going for nmr spectroscopy and then identifying the correct target and the correct lead all this is really very useful and then we have kathirovan who will be speaking on drug design a medical chemistry approach so this is you know drug design now is a multi dimensional one particularly using the computer as the uh, computer in the molecular modeling process 
So this has various concepts. Uh, it is very difficult to cover the entire uh, design process. He may be concentrating on some aspects, and then we have the uh, Guru Padaya from JSS College of Pharmacy, who will be speaking on structural analysis of organic compounds by mass spectroscopy. So mass spectroscopy is not just limited to structural analysis of simple organic compounds, but nowadays we are finding its use in drug metabolism studies. How a drug is undergoing metabolism by studying the parent molecule and the metabolite, and it is also mm -hmm. useful in drug discovery. If at all the drug is undergoing bioactivation, and the such type of molecules we can identify and use them as lead compounds. So all these topics put together, they are really beneficial to our students and faculty members who are uh, registered and. Uh, I welcome all these speakers to this two-day national webinar at College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, which is a very premier institute, I already told. And uh, I welcome you all, sir, once again. And I thank uh, Professor Girija Shastri for her great initiatives and pains in conducting this national webinar. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ananda. Thank you, Professor Rao Mai Rajan Prasad Garu, for giving a very nice introduction about the webinar and the importance of the various speakers' talks on the, about the webinar. And now I would like to call our Professor in charge, Principal Professor G. Vijay Kankar, who is going to give a who will read us about the webinar. I will call upon the stage, Professor G. Vijay Shankar, sir. Is it audible? Oh. Yes, sir. It's audible. OK, thank you. Thank you, Professor Girija Shastri Aru. So welcome to distinguished participants and distinguished resource persons and our esteemed principal, Professor Vai Rajendra Prasad Garu, and other ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar, Recent Trends in Drug Discovery, a Role of Spectroscopy in Computational Tools, 2022. So on behalf of uh, AU College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, I, Professor A. Girija G. Girija Shankar, in charge principal, Welcome you all. First of all, we'd uh, thank to our Andhra University management. So Chief Patron, Professor PVGD Prasad Redigar for accepting our uh, kind invitation to conduct the webinar in AU College of Pharmaceutical Sciences. And also thankful to uh, Professor K. Samata and our registrar, Professor V. Krishna Mohan Garu. So just I want to give you just a brief about our AU College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, which uh, previously already uh, discussed, uh, told by our principal. Just I want to give the uh, other uh, participants to know about our college, uh, the programs which we are going to conduct in our AU College of Pharmaceutical Sciences. We are having uh, BPharm four years course as well as uh, Pharma D, six years program, and M Pharm with eight specializations. So we have started 51 and later M Pharm in 1954, and college was uh, the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences was elevated to College of Pharmaceutical Sciences in 2006, that is. So ours is the uh, first. Uh, department especially to start the specialization pharmaceutical biotechnology throughout India that is. I think uh, in today's uh, webinar uh, which is going to be very very useful and it is the platform where the students can enrich their knowledge and 
they can accelerate to exchange their ideas as well as sharing their knowledge with new participants and other knowledgeable persons that is so this is the i so for this is the right uh, platform to learn more things which are going to be taking place in a re recent whatever the trends which we it is going to be happening in pharmaceutical sciences that is so i wish that because uh, today uh, i think we are having a uh, two uh, sessions and tomorrow we are having a, another two sessions so in all these sessions definitely you will enjoy and you are also going to enrich your knowledge and you are going to learn the basic uh, uh, principles especially for undergraduate students as well as uh, the fresh postgraduate students also that is so i wish the uh, webinar is going to be success and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, to the convener professor girija shastri thank you one and all Thank you very much, Professor Gidya Shankar, sir. Uh, you have given about the details about our university as well as the importance of today's webinar. So before, I don't want to speak much because we want to start the talk. So before, uh, whatever I want to say will be told by our senior host, Professor, Professor Raila Adit Kisar, as well as Professor G. Gidya Shankar, sir. So I don't want to talk much about that, about the webinar. Today, two speakers are going to give. One speaker is um, Professor Petarvi Bartamagaru. He is uh, a senior most professor in Naipur Mohani. His talk is on pharmaco informatics, including artificial intelligence in drug discovery, which is a newer topic. So, before starting, I would like to read out uh, his CV. Uh, he, he is a very senior most professor. And his CV is around 35 pages. 35 pages of CV he has. So among the 35 pages, I have taken a very few because time is very limited to talk about him. He is very, very, he is a very big person. And uh, Bhattam sir, I'm very much thankful to you that you have immediately accepted my invitation. You are busy schedule. Thank you very much, sir. So before reading, before giving his talk, I would like to read his profile CV. Uh, he, his educational qualifications is he did his PhD uh, from CDRA Lucknow and, and Master's in Pharmaceutical Chemistry from Rupanidhi College of Pharmacy, Bangalore, and uh, Bachelor of Pharmacy from Uttarakhand, uh, Grahawal University, Srinagar, Uttarakhand. Presently, he is working as a professor at Taipan Mohali. He, his field of specializations are Synthesis of computationally designed molecules, quantum medicinal chemistry, pharmacoinformatics, programming data management, drug metabolism, drug toxicity, and drug delivery, and their computational studies. And the important honors and awards he had is Fellowship of Indian Academy of Sciences, Fellowship of Andhra Pradesh AP Academy of Sciences, Fellowship of Telangana Academy of Sciences, Organization of Pharmaceutical Research of India, OBP Scientist Award, Grand Basti Research Award, Chemical Research Society of India Medal, Fellowship of Royal Society of Chemistry, RSC for London, he has an award, Fellowship of Alexander von Humboldt Stephen Bond. And uh, these are the, some of the honors and awards he has. And uh, his research experience is he is uh, very much uh, having experience in chemical bonding, novel concept, different and compounds, and uh, bio inorganic chemistry of drugs, medical chemistry of anti malarial agents, their design and synthesis, and anti diabetic agents, their design and synthesis, tautomerism in drugs, and study about the carbines, carbenes, carbones, and related reactive intermediates. And he had around 258 publications. And original scientific articles published in Indian journals is around 19. In foreign journals is 258. And he had 14 peer reviews. And he has written around nine books. And uh, totally, he is having around 350 uh, publications and books, publication books. And citations, he is more than around 5,500 citations. His H index is 37. Uh, that's about uh, his uh, CV. 
and uh, number of PhDs that he has completed, uh, the, the students who have completed under him is 29, and seven are uh, still going on. And he has MSc research projects around 16, and medicinal chemistry, M4 medicinal chemistry projects students are 122 completed and 10 are going on. And uh, uh, he has a long term visiting fellows are 12 postdoctoral fellows, and short term visiting fellows and students are around 57. And uh, he has uh, supervised as a principal investigator about 19 different projects which have been obtained from DST, CSIR, UGC, DBT, CSIR, OSDT, CST, DST, DAD, DBT, BNBF. And that is about a brief CV about Prasad Bhartam Garu. Now I would like to invite uh, Prasad Bhartam Garu to give a talk on today's topic. That is pharmacoinformatics, including artificial intelligence in drug discovery. Sir, are you on the line, sir? Yes, I am here. Sir, will you please continue? Oh. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, I, I, we can able to hear you, sir. Okay. Good morning, and, everybody. Uh, before I, I, they can't, their voice can't reach you, sir. Only I can tell you on behalf of them. Okay. They sure. they, they, we can able to hear your voice, but if they can't reach you. Okay. okay. Anyway, before we start. Uh, I would like to make small correction. No, yes, Somehow my my alma mater details uh, went uh, somewhat disturbed when you introduced me. I am a student of Andhra University. So I, I, I feel very proud to be a student of Andhra University. I studied my BSc in from degree college. Andhra University. Am I audible? Is it okay? You are audible, sir, but a little bit more loud, I think so. <clears throat> I think so. now it is possible. Is it okay? <clears throat> okay. Uh, I guess uh, okay, sir. I, I will increase my voice. Uh, I, I am a student of Andhra University. Oh, I feel proud about it. Okay. I studied my BSc from Vimuvaram Degree College uh, from uh, under Andhra University. After that, I spent my time in Vishwabharati, Santhaniketan for my okay. master's degree. After that, I went to University of Hyderabad for PhD. This is <coughs> my background. Somehow, it was uh, wrongly recorded in your, uh, uh, in your uh, uh, records for some reason. I don't, okay. Now I am going to share my screen. Uh, I hope you can see it. Do you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK. So the title of my talk is on pharmacoinformatics. I'm going to give examples in anti-cancer drug discovery. I will be giving the importance of the technology. After that, I will go to the uh, specifics on the specific case study that I am going to discuss, topoisomerases. Now, uh, my address is given here. Um, from Naipur Mohali. I am working for the past 21 years in Naipur. Now, the topic is about the computer aided drug design. Pharmacoinformatics is the topic of integrating into information technology with pharmaceutical technology. It includes bioinformatics, chemoinformatics immunoinformatics, cancer informatics, viral informatics. Likewise, every possible information technology uh, resource that is related to drug discovery are covered under the topic of pharmacoinformatics. 
this is an emerging topic and this is only very young topic of uh, which has which was born in 2003 from since then it is about um, only 19 years old topic only about 16 batches of master students obtained the degrees under this topic from nipper now i would like to begin my lecture by asking all of you to think in three dimensions every one of the drug discovery scientist should develop the habit of thinking in three dimensions this is a message which was given some time ago in journal of medicinal chemistry 2018 Murko is a scientist, uh, very well-known medicinal chemist. He suggested that the, this particular article. He wrote this article, in which he he suggested all the drug discovery scientists to start thinking in three dimensions. The article is already cited here, and the title of the article is "What Makes a Great Medicinal Chemist." this uh, topic is very very important i wish you all to read this article and learn from his experiences next i would like to go to the topic of what is the advantage of thinking in three dimension it is because the drugs are 3d objects they are not 2d objects they are not 1d objects the drugs are always 3d objects if we look at the 3d structure of any drug we will get better idea our paracetamol our metformin our pedaquilin our rifampicin or rofloxacin whatever drug that we consider they are all 3d structures so we need to have the idea about the 3d structure of every drug so that we can develop improved uh, Uh, improve drugs with improved properties okay macro molecules with which the drugs are interacting that is uh, maybe it is cox2 or cox1 or it may be ppr gamma it may be topoisomerase 2 it may be an enzyme it may be a receptor it may be an antibody it may be a, a any compound of macro molecule uh, macro molecular size they are all 3d objects so we have got to think in 3d the interaction between drug and macro molecules are all happening in three dimensions whether it is due to hydrogen bonding whether it is due to the covalent bonding uh, as in the case of cis platin whether it is due to the um, van der waals contact or whether it is due to simpler uh, concepts like dihydrogen bond or the pole of charge transfer interaction or polarization interaction in all the cases the interactions are happening in the form of 3d structures so we have to develop the habit of thinking in three dimensions why we have to tell this because in our writing when we write on paper we write in two dimensions when we write on blackboard we write in two dimensions that is how we always had the habit of thinking in two dimensions somehow this was convenient for us in the past now there are facilities available the software which can help us in thinking in three dimension are available in our laptops they are available on our desktops they are available everywhere including the lab, including our palm tops that is our mobiles mobile computers also are having the software which help us in thinking the thinking about 3d uh, the drugs so as a result we need to cultivate this habit if we want to succeed we need to think in uh, three dimensions in future this is a very very clear message i would like to tell everybody the pharmacoinformatics research or computer aided drug design or artificial intelligence in drug design all of them are directly dependent on our ability to think in three dimensions if we do not develop this habit we will make mistakes while doing the drug discovery using pharmacoinformatics so 
let us the very first develop thing that we require is to think in three dimensions all of us should cultivate this it does not come automatically to us writing on a paper comes automatically to us because every teacher taught us in that way and blackboard is also helping only in that way but thinking in three dimension we need to download the software relevant to that and then look at the molecule from all directions let us suppose we have the photograph of narendra modi ji uh, during our workshop we cannot do anything we will only look at him and we may respect him we cannot do much more than that but if narendra modi ji enters our conference hall and sits beside our coordinator dr girija shastri and ask what do you want we will all ask him sir give us the facilities to think in three dimension and give us grants up to 2 crore rupees or give us increase our fellowship we can request him if it is a photograph what we can do we cannot do anything with the photograph of narendra modi ji exactly like that 3d is very effective 2d is useless in drug discovery so drugs are always in dynamical in nature they always are undergoing dynamical character they are bond stretching angle bending is always happening even when the drug is inside the tablet when the drug is transported through body liquid body fluids it is always under dynamical state when the drug is getting affluxed or influxed through the transporters it is in 3d and it is undergoing dynamism the drug is interacting with the receptor as our enzymes it is under dynamical state the dynamical state we can understand only if we know the 3d state of the drug so we have got to think in three dimensions the chemical reactions are happening in three dimension for example a drug is getting metabolized into a more easily excretable object oxidation reaction is happening for example that reaction is nothing but chemistry that chemistry is due to the cytochrome and due to the structure of the drug if we can think in three dimensions we will be able to understand the drug metabolism otherwise we will be lagging behind in our research effort so chemical reactions are 3d drug transportation is 3d drug action is 3d drug uh, disposition is in three dimensions drug delivery is in three dimensions drug uh, toxicity is also due to its 3d factors so we have got to think in three dimensions there is no escape from this topic if you and if we want to succeed we should think in three dimensions if we decide to fail there is no problem you continue to think in two dimensions but if you have any hope of succeeding in pharmaceutical think in three dimensions this is my clear and loud message pharmacoinformatics provide an opportunity for this 3d thinking perspective there are so many tools already available and many more tools are being prepared and i am sure in the coming 10 years very very useful tools will become available to all of us let us take this example i hope you are able to see this this is the 2d structure of a drug it is giving some information to us very nice it has got a flat pyridine ring it has got an amide bond and there is an nh2 group attached to it but look at the same molecule in 3d in 3d the flat pyridine remains to be flat the carbonyl group is uh, in co in the same uh, 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 plane as that of the pyridine ring but the two nitrogen centers are showing pyrimidal character this particular pyrimidal character cannot be understood while looking at the 3d structure while looking at the 2d structure only when we look at the 3d structure the pyrimidal character becomes practical the nn bond rotation the cn bond rotation or the ring carbonyl bond rotation all of them are practical that we can understand only when we think about the dynamical state of the molecule 
to understand the dynamical state we need to understand the 3d structure so we all know about this molecule this is a magic bullet it has saved the lives of many many patients it is the anti tb agent it is being used by millions of tb patients as a first line drug this is what we know already some of the pharmacy people but there is some more story i would like to tell this drug was invented somewhere in 1940s before this drug was invented there were several uh, tents outside the city any patient with tb were thrown out of the city they were not allowed to sit inside the town because it means tb was considered to be a contagious disease since the day this drug was invented all the patients were accommodated inside inside the towns inside the cities without any hesitation because it uh, the tb does for uh, the contagious character of tb was quite significantly reduced due to the uh, utilization of this particular drug isoniazide so if we don't think about it in 3d what else we can think that is a important message next how to think about in 3d this is one way of looking at it every atom inside the drug has got cartesian coordinates associated with it for example there are several carbon atoms they are all with the atomic number 6 there is a nitrogen atom there are uh, is an oxygen atom there are two nitrogens again there are so many hydrogens all of them have got cartesian coordinates x coordinate y coordinate and z coordinate if we know these values we can easily think in three dimensions but it is a complicated way we cannot visualize the molecule when we have these coordinates that is why software is developed so that we can visualize the 3d structure so either we have to grasp the 3d structure as it is or we can grasp the numbers as as they come grasping numbers is much difficult so visually viewing the molecule in three dimensions is much easier so but but whenever we do modeling these numbers are guaranteed they are there they are in the background of the software what we are seeing is the structure this is a this one has to remember there is another way of uh, uh, representing the uh, 3d structures in in the form of numbers that is called z matrix this is a matrix i am showing you which is called z matrix the z matrix is useful in defining the 3d structure of the molecule that means whenever we go for the 3d structure there is lots of mathematics behind it that mathematics is very very useful in bringing in the 3d structure onto the computer screen such computer structures shown on computer screen are really really useful <coughs> i hope uh, can i continue some some discussion is going on anyway i am continuing uh, now let us go to the next uh, topic molecular modeling this is a topic which had its uh, initiatives in the year 1993 a international an international conference have was held online first time on the topic of molecular modeling in october 1993 between cambridge university and uh, and many universities across europe as well as in uh, usa that is the beginning of the topic of molecular modeling that is where the computer aided methods of modeling and the crystallographic methods of modeling were uh, integrated and then this new topic of molecular modeling got initiated that was the birth of molecular modeling before that there was theoretical chemistry there was computational chemistry there was bioinformatics but molecular modeling was not there now uh, since 1993 molecular modeling was growing it has become a topic of chemoinformatics in uh, in the year 1998 it has gone further beyond chemoinformatics 
into the pharmacoinformatics applicable to uh, drug discovery in the year 2003 uh, uh, in the city mohali this uh, our naipur mohali was the first institute to start the pharmacoinformatics topic across the world uh, what are the topics under pharmacoinformatics we teach molecular modeling we teach computer programming to the computer to the pharmacy students we teach the uh, crystallography to the pharmacy students we teach the drug action to the pharmaco pharmaceutics people so as a result under the umbrella of pharmacoinformatics we teach how to design drugs using computer aided drug discovery methods so for to do all that we need molecular modeling as a topic this molecular modeling is central to computer aided drug design estimating the properties of chemical species can be done easily using molecular modeling for example if i have a compound in my round bottle flask or if i have a drug molecule inside the tablet they have some chemical properties if i have the same drug on my computer screen does it carry the same chemical properties or not it should carry the same chemical properties that is the purpose of molecular modeling i am not only modeling the structure of the molecule i am also modeling the energy of the molecule i am also modeling the interactions of the molecule i am also modeling all the properties of the drug uh, that means whether it is efficacious what is the ic50 value what is the um, ld50 value what are the therapeutic indices what are the chemical properties what are the biochemical properties what are all the gram theoretical properties what are all the surface properties of the drug all of them can be modeled very easily using computer aided drug design approaches this topic was very primitive when i was doing phd in university of hyderabad in 1984 but today it is not primitive it is very well developed so i wish all the pharmacy people should adopt this topic without any failure so that is why i request the pharmacy council of india to change the pharmacy fourth semester for i mean eighth semester the b form course that is the elective course on cadd into a course on pharmacoinformatics because that is more wider in scope compared to cadd so i would like to pci i request pci to incorporate pharmacoinformatics as well as artificial intelligence as a part of that elective course uh, during the eighth semester of the b form and i want all the colleges to teach that topic if if necessary i will write books for that i am already i am already thinking about writing books for that okay uh, they are, uh, let us wait for the day one day it will come what is molecular modeling how do we be able how we will be able to estimate all the properties of the drug as it is inside the tablet how i can get to the computer screen to do that i have to do four things what are the four things first i should be able to build the 3d structure on the computer screen number 1 next step is to perform energy minimization of the molecule either using quantum chemical approach or using the molecular mechanics approach we have to do the energy minimization after that we have to perform the uh, after that we have to perform the conformational analysis we have to find out which are all the various possible conformers of the drug which are the best tautomeric states of the drug which are the most possible uh, stereochemical states of the drug we have got to do all these things at the, as a part of the third step after that we have got to consider the dynamical state of the molecule these four things when we do we are guaranteed that the properties of the molecule inside the tablet and the properties of the molecule on the computer screen are exactly the same without any failure the physics the mathematics 
the computer science the chemistry biology all of them were successfully implemented in all the software so as a result this software are reliable and trustworthy that goes they are helping us in thinking in three dimensions and performing molecular modeling giving the same kind of accuracy as that of experiments so we can completely trust 100% without any failure the uh, properties of the molecule on the computer screen in comparison to that of the uh, tablet if and only if we do these four things what is it first step is to build the molecule in three dimension on a computer screen then to perform energy minimization third is to perform uh, the conformational analysis fourth is to perform the dynamical analysis please remember this if anybody who is doing drug discovery using computer aided drug design they have got to adopt these four if they fail in doing this it will be if they will give guts uh, they will get result always computer aided methods will always give some result that may be mm, a junk in computer language there is a terminology called junk in junk out that means uh, there is a alternatively it is called garbage in garbage out suppose if you give garbage to the input as an input to the computer the program you will get garbage as an output that is the meaning of that so if you give the right information to the computer software it will give you the right output and that is highly reliable that is why pharmacoinformatics has become a reliable science for the past 20 years and all of you should adopt it in all pharmacy colleges anyway the atomic level details can be obtained using the molecular modeling the hydrogen bonding information the van der waals in contact information the ionic interactions the bonding pattern the, all of them can be visualized with accuracy that is more important with accuracy we can trust they are accurate results with molecular modeling but then if i am not sufficiently experienced i may make mistakes if somebody else is is learning for the first time he may make mistakes so that is where we need experience we need the good teachers are required i need i i wish all the colleges train very good quality teachers if you want to teach a training we are ready to provide in naipur mohalli please send the teachers to us we will train the teachers so that they can teach the teach the students the very accurate level of molecular modeling several misconceptions are available in uh, chemistry and drugs we can eliminate them i will show you the example in the next slide all the forces responsible for drug likeness like lipinski's rule they are related to 3d structures and they are related to molecular modeling there may be cosh rule there may be universally acceptable rules all of them can be they adopted using molecular modeling so the message from this slide is that molecular modeling offers many advantages in comparison to experiments they will not replace the experiments they cannot replace the experiments but they will add much more value to the experiments so as a result i wish all of you to adopt pharmacoinformatics and molecular modeling so molecular modeling offers many advantages and this information is complementary to the information coming from experimental efforts and that is why we all need to adopt it now let us take this example this is a very simple molecule all of us know all of us know about it so what do we know about it metformin is an anti diabetic drug very nice metformin um, can also show anti cancer effect very good very happy metformin especially for uh, breast cancer uh, it is suggested that those patients who are utilizing metformin as an anti diabetic drug 
they may not develop breast cancer this is a very good news for uh, 50% so there this is one of the one of the worries almost all female um, are worried whether there is any cancer uh, developing in their life okay so this this worry will go away uh, when we can know this secret that the, those people who use metformin uh, daily they will never develop um, a breast cancer that is true with many other cancers not only this there is because the metformin binds to cyp3a4 and prevents the uh, anti cancer developing chemical reactions that are happening inside the cavity of cytochrome 3a4 this is the secret which was identified in the year 2016 the crystal structure of the cytochrome 3a4 bound to metformin was already provided in 2016 since then many people are trying to identify bigonide derivatives as anti cancer agents so lots of drug discovery is happening now let us come back to my slide the slide is telling that the blue colored uh, drawing on the left hand side of my slide is the structure of any bigonide that is a structure which is chemically very acceptable but pharmaceutically it is not acceptable because the drugs based on bigonides are not neutral they are not active as a neutral they are very very dull dumb but useless metformin is useless it is only a molecule it is not a drug metformin is not a drug metformin hydrochloride is a drug the drug action of metformin hydrochloride is because it is a positively charged uh, compound if it is a neutral compound it is useless do not do not believe if any teacher teaches you metformin is a drug it, metformin hydrochloride is a drug metformin is not a drug remember what is the difference sir it is only a small difference you may argue that metformin hydrochloride is only a salt of the metformin so how the differences will emerge that is what i am going to tell you on this slide metformin is dull because it has got intramolecular hydrogen bond it is not dynamical it cannot get transported through the oct3 what is oct3 organic cation transporter the fluxing and influxing of the metformin through the cell does not happen if it is a neutral molecule because the transporter that is required is oct3 it is called organic cation transporter it only it only flux and influx of the cationic species not the neutral species so if the if the metformin is not even uh, influxed then how it will show drug action so the drug action of the metformin is possible only in the positively charged state why it is happening like that it is because the rigid metformin becomes highly dynamical after the protonation with the help of hcl the protonation increases breaks the hydrogen bond the intramolecular hydrogen bond is broken that means the cn rotation and cc rotation will happen inside the drug that means the molecule will become highly dynamical let us consider a particular student uh, in our uh, college he has given an interview uh, say for example um, uh, reddy's laboratory in hyderabad he gave an interview he is waiting for the result result is not declared on the said date result is not declared after one week also he he did, he gave an excellent result, excellent interview he was expecting that he is getting a job he will get a job he is dull because the result is not being declared he was uh, he was so dull every day he was getting depression 
the, as long as the result is not declared after suppose 15 days the result was declared they become he becomes highly dynamical he seeds he will start dancing and jumping and he will start distributing the seeds everywhere in his colony and he will start buying ticket to go to hyderabad from visakhapatnam and then he will uh, make plans how to propose to his girlfriend all these things he will become highly dynamical that is the difference between neutral metformin and the uh, cationic metformin how do i know these details i know because i think in three dimensions then look at the details the c and hydrogen the hydrogen bond is broken c n rotational uh, process increased and the uh, n inversion process became uh, becomes possible and the covalent bond becomes coordination bond inside the metformin these are all the reasons why metformin hydrochloride is acting like a drug and neutral metformin never acts like a drug so that details are available from the literature already look at the 3d structures of this there are two forms of metformin uh, in the solid state for metformin uh, polymorphs this is form a and form b and the form a is thermodynamically stable form and form b is metastable form of the um, polymorphic metastable polymorphic state of the drug you can see there is lots of differences between these two states this these differences are just because of the rotation that is the 3d structures of the metformin and there are two different rotational states are shown and these two rotational states are responsible for the polymorph a and polymorph b so these details are already known but we are not taught all these details because it is difficult to teach in 3d now the software is available so we can teach in 3d so look at this 3d structures whenever you go and wherever you work on all drug molecules whether it is the uh, whether it is the uh the anti covid drugs maybe so recently everybody is working on anti covid every day in newspaper we see that so and so company or so and so institute has developed so and so drug immediately go to the internet download this structure and convert it into 3d structure and look at its 3d structure then you will have complete idea of the informatics of the drug and we will have complete idea how to uh, how to do research on that how much time does it take to think in three dimensions about any new drug molecule it will not take more than 5 minutes it is only 5 minutes job for example there is a phd student uh, working on tamoxifen he did various formulations he prepared he knows that it is anti cancer and he knows that he wanted to prepare various varieties of uh, 3d varieties of formulations but he did not look at the 3d structure even once what a pity it is it takes 5 minutes he did phd for 5 years he did not spend 5 minutes to look at the 3d structure is it not pitiable indeed it is a derogatory research he would not have succeeded he he was a big failure i know i am talking about a one particular student because he did not look at the 3d structure of the molecule he did not get good research articles i said the moment i suggested him to think in 3d he learned it and he was just 5 minutes required to think in 3d okay adopt it all the time we will only think in 3d in future so this particular example on metformin is showing that think in 3d will help in distinguishing the polymorph a versus polymorph b of the of the drug and also to help us in understanding the transportation properties drug action properties and the drug elimination properties drug toxicity properties and how to design better drugs uh, based on this scaffold we will be able to get so this is the uh, example 
uh, uh, related to thinking in 3D. Now let us go to the next slide. Technology is associated with this thinking in 3D. Do we need to, which, which are all the technologies which require 3D thinking? QSAR require 3D thinking. Quantitative structure activity relationships, you know very well what are they. I hope they are taught to the many BFORM students. And QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationships can be understood only when we think in three dimensions. 3D QSAR is there. Of course, 2D QSR is also there. Classical QSR are there, but 3D QSR is more relevant, more accurate, more applicable for drug discovery. There are under that category, there are technologies like comparative molecular field analysis and comparative similarity analysis, COMFA, COMSIA. These technologies are there and you can learn these and utilize them. Molecular docking is a technology where as interaction between small molecule and macromolecule, we can easily understand. That is a part of uh, the day-to-day -day virtual screening in uh, today's research. Molecular dynamics is another example I already told. Every CH bond, every CN bond, every CC bond, they are always under dynamical, either bond stretching as a, or angle bending or torsional angle change. These are always happening. And these things can be understood by doing the molecular dynamics analysis. Quantum medicinal chemistry can be carried out using the molecular dynamics. De novo design can be done using molecular uh, uh, modeling and pharmacoinformatics, chemoinformatics, as well as bioinformatics. As long as they are related to drug discovery, they require 3D structures. Artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Under this category, there are so many things like machine learning methods. There is genetic algorithms method. There are the fuzzy logic methods. Then there are the um, random forest methods. Then there are the uh, ba Nova Bayesian methods, which are more close to statistics. Then of course, the QSCR is also statistics in nature. Then we have the, um, uh, knowledge based methods. There are many, many methods of artificial intelligence. All of them are part and parcel of the pharmacoinformatics. They are all uh, important. They all need the 3D thinking. Okay. Now, I will go to the specific case study called topoisomerases. What are topoisomerases? They are enzymes. The name itself is tell they are enzymes. Isomerase that itself is telling it is a an it is an enzyme. Very good. Now, what are these enzymes? What do they do? These enzymes are present in um, these enzymes are present in the uh, every cell, but in cancerous cells, these enzymes the these enzymes are expressed in uh, large quantities. That means the concentration of these enzymes is in molecules, these enzyme molecules are la is large in the cancerous cells. That means if I target these enzymes and inhibit these enzymes, I will be able to design anti-cancer drugs. What is the original character of these enzymes? They have the possibility of breaking the DNA. Why do we have to break DNA? If DNA is always stored inside the cells, 98% of DNA we are not using. We are using only 2% of the DNA. You must have heard that we are using only 2% of our brain. That is similarly, we are using only 2% of the entire DNA present in our body. 98% of the DNA is only stored and useless in that in, in one corner of the cell. What is happening? It is not one cell, every cell contains 98% of the DNA is under a, a dormant state. 
but when that is in dormant state when it is activated it actually uh, increases the strain in dna to release the strain we need to use that tau isomerases not we god has utilized nature has utilized the tau isomerases nature is creating tau isomerases to activate dna when we have active dna the replication of the cells is happening the cell division is faster when you have the active dna so the tau isomerases are activating the dna and thus the cell proliferation is happening and thus cancer is growing so if i inhibit the tau isomerase 2 or tau isomerase 1 the chances of the growth of cancer can be prevented that is a topic related to tau isomerases how do we know because we know thing we think in three dimensions so what is this topoisomerase 1 are the enzymes which break one strand of dna topoisomerase 2 are the enzymes which break the two strands of dna so what happens when one strand is broken there is a linearization of the uh, double helical arrangement that is good news but when the both the strands are broken then the G segment and the T segment will happen and the T segment will pass through the broken G segment of the DNA and thus the DNA is relaxed and the DNA becomes active. We don't want a DNA to become active. If DNA becomes active, cell division will be faster. It is a good news that 98% of the DNA is in the dormant state. If the DNA becomes active, uh, then it is uh, dangerous, okay? So if uh, it is almost like this, if everybody in the class gets 99%, then the teachers uh, will be doubted. Why, why everybody is getting 99% marks? Exactly like that. If my DNA is active, 98% of my DNA becomes active, then my cells will be divided very fast. That means I will, I will mutate from the human being into something else. Maybe I will become a dinosaur because of the greater, faster uh, cell division that is happening. So we don't want that. I, we are happy that 98% of the DNA is in the dormant state. We want it to be like that. That is why we are finding the uh, drugs for topoisomerase 2 inhibition. Okay, exists in two isoforms, isoform 2 alpha and 2 beta. There are two isoforms. Then both of them are ATP dependent. Both of them are metal dependent. Both of them undergo cleavage polarity is there. And then there is also change in ligand plus or minus 2 can happen. All those things, details are very important for their drug action. Topo 2 alpha is important for anti-cancer drug discovery. What is what hormone topo 2 alpha? Essential for survival of active growing cells. Enzyme concentration are upregulated dramatically during the cell proliferation. The topo isomerase 2 levels increase two to three folds during the G2M phase of the cell cycle, cell, cell replication cycle. Abundantly present in the rapidly proliferating cells such as cancerous cells. This is the facts about the topoisomerase 2. Among the currently used therapeutic uh, uh, regimens, approximately 50% of the all are topoisomerase 2 inhibitors or poisons. So now let us go to the 3D structure of topo 2 isomerase uh, to alpha. Look at this structure. I am showing the 3D structure. I, I hope you can see there is a green colored molecule, there is a blue colored molecule. They are very thoroughly intertwined. This is a dimer. That blue color, cyan colored unit is one molecule of the topo 2 alpha and the green colored one is another molecule of topo 2 alpha you see some pink colored uh, lines those pink colored lines are 
the dna molecule which is broken so i am showing the same molecule in two different poses one is uh, where n terminal domain is clearly shown and the other one where c terminal domain is clearly shown then in the uh, n terminal domain atp binds icrf type molecules bind and in the middle domain site and uh, marburone and other molecules bind in the c terminal domain no drug molecule binds so these are the various details of the enzyme which we can get from 3d structure these are all the 3d structures available from the protein data bank this information is good news we can um, uh, look at the 3d structures from the protein data bank very easily that is good news we don't have to do uh, molecular modeling for that purpose these are the human type and they are the topo to alpha type so they are very useful now they are trying to relax this kind of this kind of kinks the, how does it happen when the t segment g, when the g segment that is the green colored segment enters into the dna and the green colored part of the dna breaks into two parts the red colored part of the dna passes through the enzyme and then the dna becomes relaxed so for that purpose uh, this enzyme activity is very easily understandable in three dimensions g segment and the t segment will pass through and then these are the various 3d structures along the pathway look at that there is a b c d e f which are labeled the uh, 3d structures of the enzyme this is a cycle of the enzymatic activity initially the n terminal domain is widely open after some time n terminal domain is gets closed later the c terminal op gets opened and then again c terminal is closed n terminal is opened then the c terminal is closed n terminal the enzyme is always going this undergoing this kind of dynamical process that is the reason why it is able to show the drug action it is able to show the um, enzymatic action that is this is a part and parcel this particular dynamism is a part and parcel of topo2 alpha if we don't know this dynamism we will not be able to do drug discovery to know this dynamism we need to think in three dimensions there is no escape now for this molecule we can design drugs for example in the first stage of the catalysis we can design with their, these molecules are already known that is suramin and aclarubicin these are the drugs which bind at the first stage of the catalytic cycle in the second stage of the catalytic cycle novobiosin and qap1 bind in the third stage the marburone and sodium silicate bind in the fourth stage there are so many molecules doxorubicin donorubicin amsacrine like that at least seven drugs are known which bind at the fourth stage of the cell uh, enzymatic axis in the next stage there are four molecules which are already known to bind that means there are five, several stages of the catalysis and, and drug discovery can be done at any of these stages that is how we can understand in three dimensions the sequence alignment is the first step homology modeling is the second step molecular docking is the next step using glide or gold or any software molecular dynamics is the next step that is using amber software or gromax software or any software which is commercially available or freely available with us amber is what we use because it is it is cheap and best it only is about 400 dollars per year so we can easily get it then binding energy calculations can be done using the mmgbc analysis gaussian 09 software can be used for quantum chemical calculations this is also a cheap and best software uh, molecular dynamics can be done using vmd type of software likewise there are so many varieties of software which can be used for topo2 uh, alpha inhibitory action then what that is exactly what we did we went to organic laboratory 
we synthesized the molecules and we found that we should be able to, we can design atp competitive inhibitors that means these molecules that we designed will go to the atp binding domain of the enzyme and they prevent the they prevent the uh, recruitment of atp if atp is not bound cell uh, the catalytic action of the enzyme is stopped so then that means any compound which binds at the atp binding domain are acting as inhibitors and they can become a drug for topo2 alpha and thus they can help in atp help in anti cancer activity this is the hypothesis so based on this we have done the design and this design was very successful using computer aided methods then we went to organic laboratory and we synthesized these molecules professor s k guchayat is a professor who has synthesized the molecules our lab has done the molecular modeling and then we published collaboratively many research articles that is one good news then what we did we were happy these compounds were showing in vitro activity then we published the papers very nice very good by response we have got many people are using our ideas many times it was cited very good but what we did we thought that in place of r2 if i have a bulky substituent in place of r3 if i have bulky substituent can i design new molecules yes it is very easy synthetically you can design many molecules and synthesize them can we do molecular dock yes we can dock the molecules in the atp binding domain then the message is that these molecules are not getting docked inside the atp binding domain why because these molecules are larger in size the cavity of the atp binding domain is smaller so if the if these molecules do not bind in the atp binding domain they may not show the anti cancer effect so this is the hypothesis then molecular docking scientists told that do not synthesize the molecules but synthesis is not difficult as a result organic chemistry friends have done the synthesis anyway before doing the molecular docking they already synthesized the molecules and they already sent for in vitro activity then what happened the in vitro scientists told that these molecules are showing anti cancer activity the molecular dia docking scientists said that these molecules do not bind in the atp binding domain the molecular dynamic the molecular in vitro scientist is telling these molecules are showing activity so there is a partial confusion molecular dynamic scientist is telling something in vitro scientist is telling something else is it corroborative or is it not corroborative to know this many more molecular molecular modeling studies have been taken up many studies were done what is this why the docking is not successful question 1 if the docking is not successful here where else the docking can happen for the second series of compounds likewise lots of work was done and thus we found that we there is a reason that the first series of compounds bind at the atp binding domain second series of compounds do not bind at the atp binding domain that means phosphorylation reaction uh, can continue to happen when the second series of compounds were utilized indeed experimental in vitro analysis showed that the phosphorylation reaction at the atp binding domain is indeed happening even when the second series of compounds were supplied that means molecular docking and the in vitro analysis are giving same result comparative result corroborative result then what was the challenge the challenge given to the modeling scientist is if it is not binding at the atp binding domain where is it binding 
ATP is not supposed to show inhibitory action by binding at the ATP binding domain. Why and how these molecules? This is another question. To address this kind of questions, lots of molecular docking and molecular modeling was carried out, and then the question. These are the some of the results of the molecular docking, and these are some of the results. Why it is docking clearly, and what is why it is not docking clearly? Look at the right hand side structure. Look at carefully. There is a molecule with yellow color. There is another molecule with pink color. That pink color molecule is shown through the window. That window is showing that the pink color molecule is binding successfully, but the yellow color molecule is not binding successfully. This difference is responsible for the uh, drug action of first series of compounds and the second series of compounds. Now that is the pink colored. This is the yellow color. That is these details when we look at three dimensions, that is become clear to the scientific community. Phosphorylation continues to happen with the second series, but it does not happen the first with the first series. So that is the clear. The, the, by this time, it is clear that if not the ATP is domain, where is the binding site for the designed molecules? A new question came to the mind of the scientific team. Then they looked at the cycle one more time in three dimensions. Every time, look in three dimensions. That is what they have done. And finally, it was proposed that. the probable site of drug action for the second series of compounds is the merbaron binding domain so what is the merbaron binding domain what are the details what are the interactions what are the, how much of it is hydrophobic in nature how much of it is hydrophilic in nature so many questions one question linked to another question linked to another question likewise many <coughs> questions were solved and finally it has become clear where is the binding site of merbaron this was the major question that was led to the uh, literature and lots of uh, literature search and the docking were done finally found that atoposite binding domain and the merbaron binding domain domain are side by side and thus the tapoto alpha inhibitory action can be prevented Merbaron has no effect on the enzyme DNA, but the, the newly designed compounds they are showing the inhibitory activity. So this is the site where the docking is happening. Magnesium metal is there; it is showing interactions. There are several hydrogen bonds; they are all important. All of them have understood, have been understood. Look at the hydrogen bonds on the right hand side in the merbaron binding domain. What are the amino acids? Q544. Uh, R seven one three H seven five eight. What are these? These are histidines. These are arginine. These are um, uh, glycine. Uh, uh, these are the amino acids which are important. What is the what is the strength of the interaction? We can calculate. It is of the order of sixty four point one seven. This is the score given by the E model. You score after performing the glide based. the uh, docking analysis right then again docking was done again interactions were understood which interactions are directing uh, the drug into a particular pose which cavity is freely available can we design new molecules based on that newly available cavity these are some of the suggestions these are some of the docking results with the newly designed molecules so you can see that um, compound 6a is better than compound 5d likewise we can give the scores and we can uh, compare now these are all the 3d structures look at all the 3d structures carefully this is very important we should be able to develop the knack of thinking in 3d because it is not naturally occurring it cannot be by birth we have to cultivate this habit it does not happen naturally so we need to do this after that when the active dna decatenation experiment was done 5g and 6a 6b are good molecules 
and they when we do their scores we got 6a 6b are giving very very good scores whereas 5d is giving very small score then when we compare the score versus the observed decatenation uh, as a result there is a straight line then we have the um, we have the uh, comparison is it uh, happening at 100 micromolar or 200 micromolar in vitro analysis was done and then binding site was declared then we know now that there is a switch in the uh, the binding pocket that means for the molecules from the first series are binding at the atp binding domain the molecules from the second series are binding at the uh, marburon binding domain and plus there is a switch in the site of action due to the increasing size of the compounds so this is the message and this message again we published in very good journal and it is also cited in a big way now uh, we have done lot more analysis hydrogen bonding analysis amino acid analysis why the drug is binding why another molecule is not binding why the binding affinity of one molecule is very strong why it is small in other molecules what is the surface property of the drug look at this surface you can see the drug as well as the surface every drug has got a surface just like every teacher respect uh, uh, we know all uh, in a house ma- mother has got a field of influence father has got a different field of influence just like that every drug has got a field of influence this is known as the surface of the molecule the surface of the uh, molecule is shown here and uh, along with its color coded um, maps blue color means it is uh, uh, it is electron positive uh, red color means it is electro negative type of interactions are possible so likewise we have done lots of work in the marburon binding domain and found that how the um, drug action is happening the drug action is happening because um, the newly designed molecules bind at the marburon binding domain and they do not allow the cleavage of the dna if that cleavage of the dna is not happening uh, that means the drug action is successful enzyme action is successful this is the idea these are the various poses of the drugs these are the various interactions how much of it is due to van der waals contact how much of it is due to electrostatic interaction how much of it is due to surface properties how much is the gas phase and solvent phase what is the total energy then which drug is showing how much energy we can do all these things using the drug um, di- molecular dynamics analysis these are some of the results uh, of the molecular dynamics hydrogen bond is present or not present throughout the uh, drug action all these things we can uh, analyze then effect of the marburon uh, is shown through dynamics then this is uh, top cat analysis was done uh, to get the toxicity of the drugs quick probe analysis was done and uh, in the end six compounds were identified very successfully so similarly virtual screening can be done from the zinc based analysis we have identified many compounds were synthesized and we found a few compounds are very very efficacious so i would like to stop here i would like to conclude that we did do a research using the first message that i gave you that how to think in three dimensions and how to perform research in three dimensions using topo2 alpha how to design new molecules in three dimensions and perform organic synthesis as well as the uh, biochemical analysis to get the the bioactivity of these compounds so this is how we oh. we were able to successful thank you very much
Thanks to Andhra University for giving the opportunity. Hello, I cannot hear properly. Somehow it is breaking. Uh, I think maybe you better come to the mic. I am not able to hear. If you have any questions, uh, type in the chat box. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, can you able to hear my voice? Yes, now I can hear. Thank you, thank you. So you have given a very good, excellent lecture on three-dimensional structure computational studies on drug design and this discovery. So in the absence of your, uh, the questions from the audience, I would like to thank you very much for giving an excellent lecture on computational studies. Uh, in spite of your busy schedule, you have given a time for us for about one and a half hours, and that, uh, that may be useful. That will be useful for the students, for both for research scholars as well as I'm from PG students as well as UG students, sir. And I thanks once again uh, for giving the beautiful and an excellent lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Bye. I am. Uh... Stop presenting. I'm going mute. Anybody is there on online? Log out. Log in, sir. Everyone, I can see. And log out, sir, because second speaker. Uh, Join our customers. Sir, are you online? Sir, Magaru? Can you able to hear my voice, sir? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Sir, please on your video also so that we students can able to see your photo. Okay, madam, you can see me now. Oh, thank you very much, sir. <laughs> sir. Uh, my MPOM students, my research scholars, and UG and PG students were in the auditorium, and some of the candidates uh, who were joined on online. Uh, so before starting of the second uh, speaker, that is uh, Akela V. S. Sedma, who, who is a scientist in Indian Institute of Chemical Technology, and the uh, the on basic principles of NMR spectroscopy, which will be very much useful for all the branches of MPOM, because uh, for any drug discovery or design of CAD, this is the basic principle that everybody has to know. And he is, go he is going to give a very good lecture on this general principles of NMR spectroscopy. And before uh, giving his lecture, I would like to read out his biodata. Nakela uh, V. He is a principal scientist, analytical department, CSIR IACT, Hyderabad. And he did his BSc, MSc, and PhD in Osmania University on NMR spectroscopy. And he was a scientist, senior scientist, principal scientist, and senior principal scientist in IACT, CSIR Hyderabad. And he had a number of awards and uh, uh, from UG. CSIR Research Associate Postdoctoral Fellow from the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, USA. And he also did his postdoctoral research associate in Columbia, Missouri, USA. Uh, this was his brief CV, apart from his uh, very huge CV. And uh, now he is going to give a talk 
on principles general principles of nmr spectroscopy sir uh, on to termagar thank you very much madam for the thank you sir. introduction okay um if you permit me i will stop thank my you, hello sir sir i am can able to hear your voice no problem yes yes uh, i would like to turn off the camera so that uh, the reception will be good cameras ha uh, camera i will i am going to turn off and uh, i will share you, you can turn off sir you can turn off this camera no problem okay um Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Visible, visible. Is it in presentation mode? Yeah, full. Not in full mode. I think so. What about now? Yeah, now it is full mode. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning to all participants, uh, Madam Professor Girija Sastri, for giving me this uh, opportunity to tell you about the. basics of nmr can you can you hear me properly yes sir we can able to hear you prob nicely the title of uh, this talk is basic principles of nmr spectroscopy mm. okay this is this slide shows electromagnetic electromagnetic spectrum where you can see different uh, spectroscopic regions where uh, nmr spectroscopy specifically falls in the low frequency region where uh, this is uh, this is in the region uh, nmr uses this electromagnetic radiation in the radio frequency range which is uh, low frequency on long wavelength there are some disadvantages and advantages um because of this low energy it gives very sharp signals and disadvantages are poor sensitivity and longer experiment time but uh, uh, these uh, disadvantages can be over um, overcome with the help of uh, advanced technology and uh, high magnetic fields and uh, also in the superior uh, software programs used before going to the details i just give you a brief applications of nmr spectroscopy where um, there are several applications uh, are listed here and majority of the applications were uh, applicable to pharmaceutical industry um elucidate the chemical structure of organic and inorganic compounds peptides proteins nucleic acids and identification and characterization verification of molecules this uh, molecules uh, can include uh, drug molecules also um, determine the enantiomeric purity impurity profiling and uh, macromolecules ligand interactions nmr based on uh, library of compounds uh, to find out the drug candidates study of uh, biofluids which is metabolic profiling which also shows the effect of uh, effect of drugs the study of polymorphism using that in nmr nmr in medicine nmr the first nmr experiment the first nmr experiments were performed by two groups uh, which is uh, one block group 
before uh, reporting they have they don't know they are not aware of each other but uh, simultaneously it's a coincidence they reported a similar type of observation but their experimentation is different for uh, cell group it is a resonance absorption rock group performed this nuclear induction to measure uh, nuclear magnetic movements which is uh, actually foundation for uh, experimental nmr and both their observations reported in the same issue of physical review journal in 1946 and uh, the references were given here uh, so that uh, you can have a look at it nmr is uh, nuclear magnetic resonance which is uh, um elaborating like this resonance phenomena of a nuclear spin in the presence of magnetic field so resonance phenomena is nothing but uh, matching two frequencies that is in the presence of magnetic field uh, what is that resonance phenomena we'll we'll see shortly these are uh, few observations or uh, discoveries in the field of nmr the first nmr experiments were performed in 1945 uh, by block and purcell groups and 50 to 55 during this time these uh, parameters were observed from nmr spectra chemical shift coupling constants nuclear aura aura's effect spin echo um, each parameter has significance in the structural elucidation part and 1952 the uh, block and purcell were awarded with nobel prize in the field of physics on 58 it is a uh, solid state nmr 60 to 65 it is spin decoupling this is uh, a technique 1966 uh, it is fourier transform nmr which is uh, another revolution in the field of uh, nmr spectroscopy and uh, there is another revolution during 1971 to 76 it is uh, two dimensional nmr and nmr imaging which is uh, actually a medical field so we we'll, we are going to see these two parameters chemical shift and coupling constant which are uh, very um, useful in the structural elucidation and uh, spin decoupling is another technique uh, these are so uh, continuously there are developments in the field of nmr um in 7 1973 it is uh, first nmr imaging experiment was reported by lotterberg and uh, in 1977 is the first imaging technique so that uh, a um, number of images can be generated within a uh, few seconds of time so for uh, in vivo imaging are specifically whole body imaging or human imaging this uh, this type of fast imaging technique is very much required and 85 to 8 85 to 90 it is uh, development of biomolecular nmr techniques uh, like multi dimensional and multi nuclear nmr and 1991 is nobel prize in chemistry again uh, a third nobel prize awarded to professor uh, richard r ansch for his 2d two dimensional nmr technique development 92 it is functional mri this is also a kind of imaging technique only but it is uh, basically related to human brain how a human brain fun functions that can be monitored with this uh, type of functional mri technique 1997 it is another uh, uh, technique development sensitivity enhancement and 2002 and 2003 again uh, there are nobel prize uh, awards given to nmr field is uh, six personalities were awarded with nobel prize uh, for their achievements various in various developments in the field of nmr spectroscopy so what is the information one can get from nmr spectroscopy it is three dimensional molecular structure and conformations molecular dynamics 
in clinical diagnostics which is uh, related to medical field and uh, several other applications in the fields of biology chemistry clinical um, material sciences etc and one um, major advantage with nmr spectroscopy is uh, it is a non invasive technique non invasive and non destructive so that uh, a sample a sample used for uh, performing nmr experiments the sample will be intact and nothing will be happen to the sample so that the that can be used elsewhere after the nmr study so the nmr is a powerful technique uh, for the determination of uh, structure in various fields of uh, science out of which uh, this proton nmr and carbon 13 nmr are uh, more popular uh, spectra to give majority of information towards uh, structural elucidation of uh, proton nmr gives information about the number of uh, different types of hydrogens present in the molecule relative numbers of uh, different types of hydrogens and uh, their environment in the molecule and also it tells about the number of neighboring hydrogens similarly carbon 13 nmr also gives direct information of on number of carbons present in the compound and um, nmr spectroscopy is a complementary technique to x ray crystallography because uh, both give similar information but there is uh, there are few advantages and disadvantages among the techniques they are listed here um, x ray uh, requires a crystal whereas uh, nmr can be done in solution state also which is more close to real environment but uh, the major limitation with nmr is uh, size of the molecule when molecular size increases nmr spectra become uh, broad and overlaps and uh, the information can be obtained is a little difficult from overlapped signals whereas uh, molecular weight is not a constraint for nmr and uh, this is one advantage with nmr is strongest with hydrogen because uh, based on the environment the type of hydrogen can be monitored whereas uh, positions of hydrogens cannot be resolved in x ray on one major uh, disadvantage with uh, nmr is sensitivity if it is hydrogen nmr that is uh, hydrogen is more abundant 99.9% uh, abundant so sensitivity of uh, hydrogen spin 1h is not a problem but whereas uh, carbon and nitrogen and uh, several other nuclear spins they have sensitivity limitations based on their natural abundances but whereas x ray doesn't require is uh, sensitivity is not a limitation with x ray so to overcome this uh, sensitivity issue um, specifically in the field of protein nmr so carbon 13 is 1.1% abundant and nitrogen is 0.37% abundant so that uh, percentage is not enough to get um, information from proteins so a sensitivity uh, sensitivity enhancement can be achieved with the help of isotope labeling so that uh, 1% one carbon 13 can become 100% similarly n15 also will become 100% so that from net abundance wise uh, there is uh, some improvement in sensitivity because of their uh, enhanced in abundance and x ray is more reliable confirmation whereas with x nmr because of uh, solution environment it is average structure due to molecular motions which is a plus point so that we can observe the dynamics of the molecules in solution so any nuclear spin 
we are going to talk about nuclear spins only so whether it is hydrogen carbon nitrogen whatever element you take we always talk about nuclear spins um any nuclear spin with uh, a non zero value nmr signal can be observed which has uh, the, these type of isotopes have non zero nuclear spins and uh, nmr fundamentals are same regardless of the nuclear spin so the phenomena is nothing but interaction between magnetic moments of nuclear spins and the external magnetic field so which is represented by mu dot b the magnetic moment of a nucleus is associated with nuclear spin so a non zero nuclear spin will exhibit magnetic moment so that interacts with external magnetic field which which is responsible for uh, observing an nmr signal so the this table shows what are the isotopes which have nuclear spins there is a combination of uh, protons and neutrons listed here so the we see here uh, the first example uh, 12 c6 this is uh, a major isotope of carbon abundant isotope of carbon which has molecular atomic weight of 12 and um, and um, number of atomic number is 6 so the number of protons 6 and number of neutron number of neutrons can be calculated like this this is uh, a minus z which is a formula already reported so 12 minus 6 gives 6 number of neutrons so in the table if you look at the number of protons is even number of protons is nothing but atomic number and the number of neutrons which is uh, a minus z which is 6 so it's a even even combination so its nuclear spin is zero these are few examples polu carbon 16 oxygen 32 sulfur there are some more uh, nuclear spins which are having zero nuclear spin and uh, the second example 19f9 where in this number of protons is 9 and the number of neutrons is a minus z which is 19 minus 9 which gives odd even combination so this has a nuclear spin value of half and these are a uh, few uh, spins come under this category and the another category is 13c6 in the first category we see 12c6 now it is 13c6 which is another isotope of carbon um which is which is having uh, even number of protons and odd number of neutrons so this come under this category this is also having a spin of value Uh, half and uh, another category of uh, combination is 14n7 where uh, number of protons is odd and number of neutrons is also odd so this is uh, this category this category has uh, spin 1 and uh, these are few isotopes come under this category and nmr phenomena corresponding to spin half is much simpler to understand and uh, our uh, required nuclear spins carbon uh, 1h and carbon 13 have nuclear spins of half so in the following discussions we will be concentrating on these uh, spin half nuclei of proton and carbon so these are uh, few nmr active nuclear spins with their uh, nuclear spin numbers and the gyromagnetic ratio which is a specific constant to each and every nuclear spin and uh, the next column shows 400 100 etc which is corresponding uh, resonance frequencies of those nuclear spins at a magnetic field of 9.4 tesla because usually magnetic fields units were uh, gauss or tesla so here uh, we represent the unit as tesla and uh, the corresponding abundance also listed here so any nuclear spin i can exist in 
2n i plus 1 spin states. So a spin half nuclear spin will have two spin states. We can substitute that half value in this equation 2n i plus 1 which gives value 2. And uh, for other spin values also, the numbers were calculated. There are uh, three states for spin 1, seven states for spin 3, and etc. So the, the complexity of the description will become more and more when it is other than spin half. So we concentrate our discussion to spin half. Proton and carbon 13 will have spin half, which has two spin states, plus half and minus half. Mm, for our arguments, we call them as alpha and beta. In the absence of magnetic field, these two spin states are having equal energy. So we cannot distinguish which is which. But whereas in the presence of magnetic field, they split and one align with magnetic field direction, which has lower in energy and the other one opposed to magnetic field direction which is having higher in energy. So the larger the magnetic field, the greater the energy separation between these two spin states. So the entire NMR uh, phenomena depends on the separation of these spin states. So there are uh, <coughs> ways to improve the energy separation in by increasing the magnetic field. In the next slide, it shows the magnetic field dependence of these two spin states. Um, in the absence of magnetic field, that means B0 is 0, the two spin states are degenerate, that means they have equal energy. In the presence of magnetic field, when magnetic field increases, you can see the separation between the spin states increases. Delta E is equal to KB0 is also equal to H nu, which is uh, Planck's constant and nu is uh, mutation frequency. So this is uh, goes in the increasing magnetic field. And more and more magnetic field, there is more and more separation that decides the resolution of the NMR spectra. So this cartoon shows uh, directly in the absence of magnetic field, all the spins are um, randomly oriented in the NMR tube. This is uh, just assume this as NMR tube, in the solution. In the solution, there are uh, different types of uh, proton spins, carbon spins. There may be several spins depending upon the molecule we choose. So. Um, for our uh, argument, let us say we assume these are proton spins, spin half. In the absence of magnetic field, all spins are randomly oriented. There is no directional dependence. But as, in, as soon as the NMR tube is kept in the magnet, all the spins are oriented. Some of them oriented upwards, some of them oriented downwards and magnetic field direction is upwards. So these spins oriented upwards, they are in lower energy and uh, opposed to magnetic field spins are having higher in energy. So in this condition, is when it absorbs RF radiation that matches with the energy difference between the two spin states. So the two variables characterize NMR are applied magnetic field and the frequency of radiation that used to excite the nuclear spins. So this is like this when uh, the radio frequency radiation matches with the energy separation between the spin states then the resonance condition occurs so that can be seen here in the bottom plot. So here this 
this cartoon diagram shows this is an ideal condition um, of the sample has two isolated spins but they are coupled to each other they are talking to each other so in the top spectrum top trace which is correspond to 60 megahertz so now 60 megahertz means corresponding to a magnetic field suppose uh, 60 megahertz means it is 1.4 tesla magnetic field at 1.4 tesla magnetic field proton resonance frequency is 60 megahertz because this uh, in the one of the earlier slides i have given a table here 1h resonance frequency is 400 megahertz at 9.4 tesla magnetic field so correspondingly one can calculate um, 60 megahertz corresponding to what magnetic field so it it is corresponding to 1.4 tesla magnetic field, magnetic field and this magnetic field to resonance frequency correlation relation is a linear uh, relation so we can ex always extrapolate 60 megahertz is corresponding to a magnetic field of 1.4 tesla so um, you can extrapolate so if it is 600 megahertz then the magnetic field is 14 tesla similarly one can calculate for 200 megahertz so now for 600 megahertz we are saying it is 14 tesla magnetic field so for 200 megahertz it is one third of 600 so magnetic field also can become one third of 14 tesla which is 4.7 tesla so now here this uh, cartoon shows the same two isolated spins um, proton NMR is acquired at 60 megahertz that means 1.4 tesla magnetic field 4.7 tesla and the corresponding magnetic field is here which is uh, around 18 tesla magnetic field corresponding to 750 megahertz so when magnetic field is increasing you can see the separation between the lines <coughs> because uh, for your understanding these uh, doublets were uh, indicated with colors these two doublets are crossed each other at 60 megahertz because of uh, less resolution they have overlapped with each other whereas at 200 megahertz there is a clear separation between these two doublets and uh, the chemical shift as well as coupling constants can be measured very clearly and at 750 megahertz it is even more clear this is just to show how nmr lines resolve as a function of magnetic field and in the next slide we see a real example in the first trace it is ethanol spectrum acquired at 30 megahertz 30 megahertz means it is corresponding magnetic field is 0.7 tesla this is very low magnetic field so we can see only three hums there is no resolution in each hum when the magnetic field is increased a little bit made two times then you can see uh, splittings in each hump. If magnetic field is increased further, the splitting is more clear in the bottom trace. <coughs> and nowadays, the magnetic magnetic fields were uh, reached several orders of magnitude uh, shown here. Now it is the uh, highest magnetic field achieved is. Uh, almost from 1000 megahertz corresponding to 27 tesla magnetic field 
that is highest so far. <laughs> so 27 Tesla magnetic field corresponding to a resonance frequency of 1000 megahertz for proton. So these are uh, different magnetic fields shown here, not 27, it is 23.5, which is shown here in this table at the bottom. So these are first column shows magnetic fields and corresponding proton resonance frequencies and also carbon 13 resonance frequencies also given here. <coughs> so how to calculate these resonance frequencies when you are given magnetic field? So it is a simple relation nu is equal to gamma h0 divided by 2 pi. <coughs> gamma is the geromagnetic ratio which is a constant specific to each and every nuclear spin. h0 is magnetic field which is shown in the first column and 2 pi is a constant. <coughs> So the calculation can be done like this is 16.45 tesla magnetic field aeromagnetic ratio of proton is this much 26.75 into 10 power 7 tesla inverse and second inverse so the magnetic field um, the resonance frequency of proton at 16.4 tesla is 700 megahertz <coughs> So this uh, relation can be extrapolated. So you can calculate for a, any type of magnetic field uh, and its corresponding resonance frequency. And what, how to calculate carbon-13 resonance frequency or nitrogen-15 resonance frequency? For that also, they have uh, a specific aromatic ratios available, uh, which are available uh, um, over web. <coughs> And uh, it is a similar calculation since magnetic field is constant, only geromagnetic ratio changes um, for carbon 13 and 6.28 is constant. So its corresponding uh, resonance frequency for that nuclear spin can be obtained. <coughs> Are you hearing me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. If it is okay, I will continue. Hello? Shall I continue? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Okay, here I will show uh, a real NMR spectrometer um, quickly before going to uh, actual uh, discussion on chemical shifts and coupling constants. This is the uh, highest magnetic field in IICT, which is corresponding to 16.4 Tesla magnetic field and corresponding proton resonance frequency is uh, 700 megahertz. So this white color cylinder is nothing but uh, superconducting magnet and uh, adjacent to it, left side it is a console and right side also it is a part of electronics. So a, a number sample can be inserted at the top through this uh, red color, uh, red color uh, tube and magnet um, sample seats in the middle of the magnet, at center of the magnet, where uh, a RF circuit is placed and RF energy is pumped through this RF circuit, which excites nuclear spins in the sample. Once RF energy is turned off, the excited spins will come back to equilibrium, which is a natural phenomenon. So the spins, whatever excited, and uh, they give back the energy whatever they absorb while returning to equilibrium. That energy will absorb in the form of an NMR signal. 
So present high resolution NMR spectrometers use superconducting magnets which generate very high and stable magnetic fields which is a, a, a requirement, primary requirement for uh, any NMR experiment where uh, a stable magnetic field, stable and homogeneous magnetic field. Protons in different environments absorb at slightly different frequencies. The frequency at which a particular proton absorbs is determined by its electronic environment. Yeah, this may confuse you a little bit because protons in different environments absorbs at different frequencies. Because you can ask me because all our protons, so all protons should exhibit same magnetic field, but that is not right because these proton nuclear spins also act like small magnets. So in the presence of magnetic field, these small uh, nuclear spins also exhibit their own magnetic fields depending upon their environment in the molecule. Modern NMR spectrometers use the constant magnetic field strength V0 and then a narrow range of frequencies is applied to achieve the resonance of all protons. So this is in the form of uh, radio frequency that externally we supply to RF circuit. So this is a cross section of a magnet. Okay, here it is more clear. Left side you can see um, a superconducting coil uh, which is always immersed in liquid helium and uh, this chamber, liquid helium chamber is surrounded by liquid nitrogen. Because uh, um, the superconducting coil produces the field is placed in liquid helium bath so that electric resistance of the coil wire is zero because that is the superconducting principle. At that particular temperature of 4 degrees Kelvin, there won't be any resistance developed in the coil where current always passes in the coil. The helium divar is surrounded by liquid nitrogen divar to reduce the boiling rate of helium liquid. Helium is very expensive and uh, um, the resources are not available in India. We need to import since it is a very low boiling liquid and uh, expensive. We need to protect and save helium. So it can be done with the help of liquid nitrogen because liquid nitrogen is easily available and can be produced anywhere. So with the help of liquid nitrogen, this uh, boiling rate of helium liquid will be reduced. So this coil uh, is nothing but a super uh, wire of several um, several miles. The length of the superconducting coil is uh, typically several miles. This is a small thin wire wound around like this in the form of a coil and the current is introduced into the coil, the current always circulates in the coil and moving current generates magnetic field, but which is sensitive to sensitive to uh, resistance and temperature. At uh, 4 degrees Kelvin, there won't be any resistance developed in the coil so that uh, the current stays forever in the coil as long as the conditions are maintained. So when the current stays in the coil, it always generates a continuous stable magnetic field. Since the magnet involves uh, a periodic maintenance, so may, uh, maintaining the superconduct mag magnet is a challenge and um, expensive. Before superconducting magnets, their uh, NMR spectrometers use permanent magnets and electromagnets, but where uh, those magnets uh, cannot generate high magnetic fields. So that all uh, electromagnets were replaced with superconducting magnets. Even though it is expensive, we can attain very high magnetic fields so that uh, we can get very resolved and uh, high sensitive NMR spectra. These are few reference standards 
use specifically used in liquid state NMR with reference to these uh, signals, the chemical shifts corresponding to a compound um, hydrogens or carbons can be measured. One of the popular uh, reference standard is tetramethylsilane, uh, particularly for organic solvents. The tetramethylsilane is a liquid. So it is easily miscible with the uh, majority of organic solvents. So the compound, um, any organic compound is uh, soluble in organic solvents. So where tetramethylsilane can be used as a reference standard. For other samples, which are not organic completely, they are uh, inorganic or polar compounds, then DSS or TSP can be used as a reference standard. The DSS and TSP are solids. So a small amount of uh, this material can be added directly to solvent. Tetramethylsilane is having a central silicon atom connecting uh, with four methyl groups. All four methyl groups are identical. So it gives a, a sharp singlet uh, at zero ppm. Single sharp intense signal at zero ppm and not interfering with any sample of interest. That is one big advantage with uh, TMS. And other advantage is uh, which is inert, which will not react with any compound and volatile, easy to remove. So here uh, the the proton NMR spectrum. Prot now I'm uh, from now on I will say proton only, which is nothing but um, isotope of hydrogen, which is one H, which is having a spin number of half. So this is a proton NMR spectrum of menthol uh, dissolved in chloroform containing TMS. There you can see a TMS signal here at 0 ppm and uh, solvent signal also can be seen at uh, 7.26 ppm. With reference to TMS, one can measure the chemical shift values corresponding to these signals. And now we talk about one of the crucial structural parameter, chemical shift. Chemical shift is first observed in uh, 1950 in nitrogen, which is the most uh, dramatic observation, was observed with the uh, ethanol sample, where uh, chemical shifts can be measured corresponding to ethanol protons, which opened up a new area of structures in organic chemistry. See, actually, NMR phenomena started by two physicists. It is actually a subject derived from physics. Initial exp NMR experiments were done to measure nuclear magnetic moments. Once the chemical shift parameter is observed, then which opens up a, a new area of structures in organ chemistry based on this. So now onwards, this uh, NMR is more applicable to chemistry rather than physics. So physics were more disappointed as a method to obtain nuclear magnetic moments was clouded by the chemical shift observation. So what is the background for chemical shifts? If you take a compound, an organic compound, it has uh, several protons on it. In principle, all protons should have the same chemical shift value. But surprisingly, different protons are exhibiting different chemical shift values. So there is something else uh, is influencing the, their chemical shift values, their positions in the NMR spectrum. The phenomena of NMR chemical shift arises because of motions of electrons. So now, these electron spins also come into picture. 
the motions of electron spins induced by the external magnetic field generate secondary fields the net magnetic field at the location of a nuclear spin because uh, all protons are not at a similar environment if you take a molecule some protons are methyls some protons are coming from ch2 some are aromatic proton some of them are oh nh based on those environments their uh, net magnetic field exhibited by those protons are different so like that the each and every nuclear spin generate their own magnetic fields which oppose which can oppose or enhance the main magnetic field at their particular site this effect is called nuclear shielding so this can be written like this the magnetic field is modified like this bi bi is the net magnetic field corresponding to a proton spin is equal to b0 which is main magnetic field multiplied by 1 minus sigma i sigma i is shielding constant the value of chemical shift depends on the electronic environment of the particular nuclear spin in a molecule so what is this electronic environment electronic environment is not, nothing but it is an effect of electronegativity of different nuclear spins surrounding the proton spin of interest so the difference between two resonance signals is measured in frequency units increases with b0 okay here we talked about the environment based on the environment the chemical shift values corresponding to different protons will change okay we will see few examples in the following slides how this electronic environment influences the chemical shift values before that one more thing i would like to show here resonance frequency is directly proportional to static field that we already talked about it so uh, a resonance frequency corresponding to one particular magnetic field is calculated so for any other magnetic field we can simply extrapolate um, since it is a real linear relation so difference between two resonance signals measured in frequency units increases with b0 so at small magnetic fields the resonance frequency is small when magnetic field is increasing resonance frequency also increases so with respect to resonance frequency the difference between two resonance signals also increase because in one of the earlier slides i displayed a cartoon where we can see the difference between the resolution between the uh, doublets that is nothing but in the form of hertz frequency units but chemical shifts are independent of magnetic field so the change in um, the increase in the difference of resonance uh, be difference between two resonance signals is not acceptable uh, so we need to have some alternative mechanism to measure the chemical shifts and their units because we need to measure the chemical shifts in such a way that for any magnetic field if you measure the chemical shift it should be identical it is a magnetic field independent so this relation shows delta which is a chemical shift parameter denoted by delta equal to omega minus omega reference divided by omega 0 multiplied by 10 power 6 this first omega correspond to the position of a um, proton spin which we are measuring and omega reference corresponding to position of uh, reference standard so it will give some value in hertz units divided by 
divided by resonance frequency multiplied by 10 power 6. So these are omega and omega reference are offset frequencies of the signal of interest and reference signal. And chemical shift measured in parts per million. So this entire relation gives parts per million units. Before that, it is heads units because omega is heads, omega reference is heads, and omega zero is resonance frequency also heads. Heads divided by heads, it cancels. It actually a, a unitless quantity since it is multiplied by 10 power 6. So a name, a unit is given to this particular parameter delta, which is called parts per million ppm. So there is a uh, relation between ppm and has units. Now we are going to see this. This relation changes as a function of magnetic field. Suppose magnetic field is 9.4 Tesla. And corresponding resonance frequency of proton is 400 megahertz. 400 megahertz. So if we get the ppm value on this particular um, no, heads uh, value. So 1 ppm is equal to 400 heads at 400 megahertz proton resonance frequency. Similarly, 1 ppm is equal to 200 heads at 200 megahertz proton resonance frequency. So it is easy to remember because 400 megahertz uh, proton resonance frequency, 1 ppm is equal to 400 heads. Similarly, at 200 megahertz proton resonance frequency, 1 ppm is equal to 200 hertz. So this number of hertz equal to 1 ppm is corresponding to the resonance frequency. So this slide shows the comparison of two different resonance frequencies and their chemical shift values in hertz as well as ppm. So this chemical shift is equal to shift downfield from TMS in heads divided by spectrometer frequency. And you can see the top top table correspond to 60 megahertz and uh, corresponding chemical shift scale, um, uh, scale is given 0 hertz 120 And in the bottom table, it is corresponding to um, 300 megahertz. Hertz scale is uh, changing, whereas PPM scale is constant. If you look at carefully, so we already looked in earlier slides, one PPM at that particular resonance frequency is equal to that many heads. So here in the top one, one ppm is equal to 60 heads. In the bottom one, it is one ppm is equal to 300 heads. Now you can get one clarity that uh, how ppm and heads scale are uh, uh, Is it clear? Hello? Hello, is it clear? Hello, is it clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, because uh, you need to understand about this relation. Otherwise, in the following trades, you may find. Because uh, from now onwards, um, NMR spectra will be displayed in PPM values only. 
so we don't talk about uh, hedge scale for chemical shift values since chemical shifts are magnetic field independent that's why this ppm scale is designed uh, corresponding to hertz scale so then i will move to next slide the relative position of absorption of a signal in the nmr spectrum is chemical shift value now chemical shift has a, a definition now and it's a unitless number but a ppm value is given uh, per proton the usual scale of nmr spectra goes from 0 to 12 ppm in uh, some extreme cases the chemical shift go beyond 12 ppm for carbon 13 the chemical shift range is 0 to 220 ppm and the zero point is defined as position of absorption of reference standard in this particular case we say it is tms 0 ppm and this standard has only one type of carbon and one type of hydrogen that is a good thing with the tms so tms can be used as a reference standard for uh, proton as well as carbon 13. similarly it can be used as a reference standard for silicon also because Silicon 29 also gives NMR signal. This slide shows the typical proton chemical shift range. This is only an approximation. In the real situations, um, an individual proton chemical shift may go out of this range little bit out of this range but not drastically so if you see you know, from bottom which is uh, less electronic environment that's why the chemical shift value is very low 1 ppm around 1 ppm when electronic environment is increasing say r ch2 or r3 ch um, there are the, then um, some of these uh, halogens also come into picture when halogen is uh, attached then chemical shifts um, go to higher scales higher ppm values because of uh, their more electronegativity similarly oxygen oxygen electronegativity influences it neighboring hydrogens similarly aromatic protons aldehydes and in the top one there are uh, three yellow bars which are corresponding to OH, NH and carboxylic acids because they are their chemical shifts are more dynamic um, in the same OH may not show same chemical shift all the time because they are very sensitive to temperature pH and concentration so based on those three parameters, these OH and H and carboxylic acid chemical shifts will vary. Similarly, carbon-13, same explanation, whatever explanation we are giving electronic environment influences the chemical shifts of protons. Same explanation can be given to carbon-13. Not only carbon-13, for any nuclear spin NMR, this electronic environment, environment influences their chemical shift values. So a less electronic environment methyl carbon is having lower chemical shift value and uh, slowly increases when uh, halogens are attached, oxygen is attached and aromatic carbons, carbonyl carbons and um, other ketone carbons, acid carbons. So it, the scale goes from 0 to 220 ppm for carbon-13. Okay, now this slide shows an idea how electronegativity influences the chemical shift value of this methyl proton. In the le extreme left point corresponding to methyl proton chemical shift value of 
um, corresponding to silicon which is uh, connected to silicon so silicon is a little bit more electro positive so that's why the chemical shift value is zero same methyl group if it is attached to carbon carbon means little more electronegative when compared to silicon so its chemical shift value increased a little bit so it is at 1 ppm so same methyl connected to nitrogen then it increased further it increased further with oxygen and with fluorine is more electronegative so methyl proton chemical shift value adjacent to fluorine is having highest chemical shift value in this group so this type of uh, um, argument can be given to any other based on their electronic environments and at the end of this uh, presentation we will see few case studies um, then you can assign those chemical shift values so this is one example ethyl benzene and benzene chemical shift value benzene protons chemical shift value at 7 ppm and uh, ch2 directly attached to aromatic ring is having around 2.5 ppm and methyl which is uh, away from benzene ring which is having uh, around 1 ppm value similarly propyl alcohol ch2 directly attached to oxygen is having higher chemical shift value among these uh, other protons and OH is having uh, two, 2 ppm chemical shift value but uh, we cannot give any argument for OH protons as I said these are sensitive to temperature concentration and pH so their chemical shift value cannot be predicted so then we can talk about other two CH2s then the second CH2, which is a little bit away from OH, is having chemical shift value between 1 and 2. And the methyl group, which is far from OH, is having a chemical shift value less than 1 ppm. This is a proton NMR spectrum of ethanol. Whatever explanation is given for, for propyl alcohol, same explanation can be given here. So CH2 directly atta attached to oxygen is having higher chemical shift value 3 ppm and CH3 away from OH is having chemical shift value at 1 ppm and the OH chemical shift at 4 ppm and TMS at 0 ppm and OH ppm um, cannot be predicted um, you can simply measure wherever it comes so this is corresponding and chemical shift values can be measured in the middle of each multiplet so this chemical shift value since it is singlet it is easy to measure but whereas uh, this is uh, ch2 chemical shift value is uh, multiplet four lines you can see so chemical shift value can be measured middle of center of this four line signal similarly chemical shift value of this three line signal can be measured in the, on the center line This is uh, also a proton NMR spectrum of uh, butyric acid as uh, measured earlier chemical shifts. How we measured chemical shift values here. Uh, similarly, chemical shifts values can be measured for these uh, signals also. So the chemical shift value corresponding to CH2, green CH2 which is directly attached to carboxylic acid it is corresponding to this uh, three line signal so chemical shift value can be measured in the middle of this uh, signal so middle of this signal is this central line and uh, another chemical shift is can be measured here in this six line signal that is uh, 1.67 and the other one is again the three line signal this chemical shift can be measured on the center line so each proton group 
there are three different types of proton groups ch2 ch2 and ch3 each proton group exhibits um, it's not single line there are three lines in uh, green ch2 and six lines in the middle ch2 that is red and three lines on this uh, pink color ch3 ch3 group so about these uh, multiple lines they are corresponding to the spin spin interactions which is uh, nothing but spin spin coupling that we will see in the next slides so uh, for the time being we talk about chemical shift value measurement of chemical shift values only so this green ch2 corresponding to this uh, three line signal which is having higher chemical shift value among these three signals and the red ch2 is corresponding to 1.67 ppm and pink color ch3 correspond to 0.98 ppm similarly this is little bit big molecule where you can see more complexity in the spectrum but chemical shifts can be measured in the middle of this multiple signal each multiple signal because uh, at this particular uh, where arrows are shown that is each one corresponding to one particular proton group so similarly other proton group signals also can be seen and there is some overlap in the uh, signals at 1 ppm close to 1 ppm so when molecular size increases then there will be more and more overlap like this this is more complex very difficult to measure chemical shift values individually of course there are ways to improve the resolution in the spectrum the alternative is two dimensional nmr so currently we restrict our discussion to small molecules and uh, one dimensional proton or carbon spectra measuring chemical shift values and coupling constants so this is about chemical shift values now then we jump to spin spin coupling so in this spin spin coupling there are two types of spin spin interaction spin spin coupling is nothing but it is spin spin interaction how spins are interacting and what is its result so there are two types of spin spin interactions one is uh, uh, interaction through chemical bond other one is special interaction so through chemical bond is like this so these two protons are interacting to, to through these three chemical bonds whereas um, in special interaction it shows like this the chemical shifts won't intervene in their interaction so here uh, the so for currently we talk about uh, through bond interactions only because the special interactions are averaged to zero because uh, the special interaction is denoted by d these uh, interactions are averaged to zero and the nmr signals are short whereas in solids and heavy, highly viscous liquids d is not completely averaged to zero make the nmr lines broad and make the nmr spectrum complex so we restrict our discussion to um, through bond interactions that is scalar coupling interactions so this spin spin interaction is first observed by gutowski in 1951 he assumed nuclear spins are like tiny magnets and interact with each other the splittings of spectral lines which is called fine structure so the splitting of lines can be seen in the spectrum of ethyl alcohol where ch3 is uh, uh, like triplet and ch2 is displayed like a quartet which is called quartet four lines and oh is a singlet so high resolution nmr spectra of liquids reveal fine structure due to interactions between nuclear spins 
so these interactions mediated by the electrons forming the chemical bonds again electrons come into picture in the spin spin coupling area also which is known as spin spin coupling or scalar coupling so how these uh, spin spin interactions so all spins interact with each other in a molecule or uh, some of the spins interact with each other yes there is a limit um it is like this this strength of this interaction is measured by scalar coupling constant n j a b where n is the number of covalent bonds separating the nuclear spins a and b and j is expressed in hertz so the number of chemical bonds separating the two nuclear spins which are interacting that is important so here the the nuclear spins which are uh, separated by two chemical bonds or three chemical bonds only can be observed more than three chemical bonds the interaction becomes very weak and the splitting cannot be observed the splitting of a particular nuclear depends on the number and its nuclear spin quantum number interacting with which follows the rule so because we ne we need to know also suppose if a proton is interacting with one proton or two protons or three protons then how do we expect the splitting pattern should look like so based on this relation we can uh, estimate how many number of lines can be observed for a particular nuclear spin so it is 2 ni plus 1 for a proton and carbon 13 i is equal to half so this equation 2 ni plus 1 becomes n plus 1 so how to calculate the number of lines based on it is only a quick approximation to calculate the number of lines suppose a particular proton is isolated it, it is not interacting with any nuclear spin any proton so it will look like a singlet as a singlet in in this particular example suppose this oh it is not interacting with anything so it is looking like a singlet so this is one particular one that example and uh, when it is interacting with one proton either uh, two chemical bonds away or three chemical bonds away it will look like a doublet it will look like a doublet and uh, and doublet lines will have the intensity ratio of 1 is to 1 that means a doublet will have equal lines and whereas a triplet if that particular proton is interacting with two protons then the splitting pattern look like as a triplet with intensity ratio 1 is to 2 is to 1 it is uh, like this like this triplet Methyl triplet is one is to two is to one ratio. Similarly, um, if the proton is interacting with three protons, then it will look like a quartet, one is to three is to one intensity ratio. Then this uh, particular uh, table can be extrapolated extrapolated for any number of protons interacting. So accordingly, one can estimate the number of lines can be expected. with that interaction so here is a simple cartoon showing two isolated protons but isolated but they are interacting with each other chcl2 cho so there are uh, two different types of protons these two are two different types of protons and these two protons are separated by three chemical bonds 1 2 3 a and b are separated by three chemical bonds so we can expect a splitting pattern among between these two nuclear spins so a is interacting with b that means only one proton so one can expect a doublet for a similarly b is interacting with a that is one proton so that we can expect a doublet for b also so these two doublets are shown here with uh, coupling constant j a b of course the here we can say 3j ab since 
this coupling to be a is interacting with b b is interacting with a so their coupling constants also equal because of this proton and mr spectra are not typically as simple as carbon 13 spectra which usually give a short peak for each different carbon atom in the structure proton and mr spectra are much more complex because of these splittings the spin states of uh, neighboring protons exert a small influence on the magnetic field and therefore on the chemical shift of a given proton the result is that proton signal in the nmr spectrum are typically split into multiplets the phenomena is called coupling the consequence of this splitting consequence of this coupling is called signal splitting and the type of multiplets can be named as doublet triplet quartet etc depends on the number of protons on the next carbon next carbon means it is like this because uh, protons are not individual they should be attached to either carbon or nitrogen or phosphorus whatever so here this particular proton on this carbon is adjacent to this carbon and this proton so the protons on adjacent carbons which are separated by three chemical bonds in other case protons connected to same carbon protons connected to same carbon like this uh, here in this particular case proton these two protons are connected to a single carbon that means these two protons are separated by two chemical bonds so this splitting also can be observed in addition to the splitting separated by uh, corresponding to proton separated by three chemical bonds so this type of splitting can be observed so accordingly they can be named as doublet triplet quartet etc and uh, here is a small explanation about the intensity ratios for a triplet the explanation can be given like this because it is uh, ch3 ch2 cl this methyl proton group uh, will appear as a triplet in the nmr spectrum with 1 is to 2 is to 1 intensity ratio then how can we explain that uh, intensity ratios it is like this methyl protons experience a magnetic field somewhat influenced by chlorine okay that is not important also affected by the adjacent methylene ch2 since there are two protons on this uh, adjacent carbon so methyl will appear as a triplet and these two protons of ch2 can have the following possible combination of spin orientations because a spin half Uh, can have two spin states one is plus half other one is minus half so here in this case these two protons will have different kinds of spin orientations how those orientations what are the possible combinations so here is uh, three different combinations either these two spin states can be up two spin states can be down and uh, these two spin states one will be up one will be down and r one will be down one will be up there are in this particular case there are two possibilities so overall there are three different kinds of combinations can be possible one is uh, in this case it is only one possibility and uh, two spins down also one possibility but uh, one up and one down there are two possibilities so there are uh, since there are two possibilities here then this line will have intensity ratio of 2 so other ones are 1 1 is to 2 is to 1 intensity ratio a similar explanation can be given to quartet also because in the same same compound now uh, we have seen about uh, methyl triplet now we look at uh, ch2 quartet 
because CH2 is directly interacting with uh, three protons of methyl group. Similarly, these three methyl group protons will have uh, different spin state orientations. In the first combination, all spins are up. In the other combination, all spins are down. So there is only one combination, one possibility. In the other than this, there are two possibilities. In one possibility, uh, there are three different combinations of spin orientations, two up and one down. And the, uh, in the other possibility, two down and one up. In this possibility, there are three different possibilities possible. So one is to three is to one um, ratio for a quartet. So here is a, a real example of uh, proton NMR spectrum of butyric acid. Uh, we have seen earlier to measure the chemical shift values. Now we measure everything, chemical shift values as well as coupling constants. So this is a formula like this and uh, the proton on each carbon are having different orientations. This uh, first one is methyl, which is having three protons. And next one is CH2, which is having two protons. And the third CH2 is two protons. And now we have to look for their uh, possible splitting patterns. Suppose uh, we start with CH2, which is adjacent to COOH, which is having higher chemical shift value because of uh, um, electronic environment coming from two oxygens here. So this particular CH2 has a higher chemical shift value. Since it is directly interacting with two protons on adjacent carbon, so it will look like a triplet. Similarly, the middle CH2, um, little bit away from COOH, so it will get less chemical shift value. But uh, splitting wise, it has uh, two adjacent carbons and two adjacent carbons on one carbon, there are three protons on the other adjacent carbon, there are two protons. So five protons interacting with this particular CH2 protons. So five protons means uh, one can expect six lines based on N plus one rule. And these six lines will have intensity ratios. We can see, look, at, look into the Pascal triangle. How this uh, intensity ratio for a six line pattern it is one is to five is to ten is to ten is to five is to one so middle lines are equal and the second line and last but one line are equal and first line and last line are equal so it is having one is to five is to ten ten five and one intensity ratio which is corresponding to this red ch2 and uh, we can expect two different couplings one with uh, ch3 other one is green ch2 but in this particular case both couplings are equal 7.5 7.5 that's why we see a six line pattern for methyl group it is also interacting with two protons um, so it will look like a one is to one one is to two is to one triplet so coupling constants are all coupling constants are 7.5 and all are three chemical bonds away from each other. In addition to this type of splitting patterns, because here um, CH2, CH3 protons anyway, they're always equivalent. Protons of a methyl group are all always equivalent because there is a fast rotation uh, among the uh, protons of methyl group but ch2 because of there is no rotation possible um, majority of times each proton of ch2 will have a different chemical shift value but of course in butyric acid in this particular case they are having same chemical shift value and same coupling constant but in the um, other compounds, majority of other compounds, the two protons of CH2 will have two different chemical shifts. So they are called chemically not equivalent protons. Suppose here we, we say an example, which is on first carbon, there is one proton and second carbon, there is one proton and a CH3 group directly attached. 
so we look at uh, splitting patterns for h2 proton so based on our previous experience uh, with two chemical bonds away or three chemical bonds away splittings can be observed so here the h2 proton is uh, three chemical bonds away away from h1 as well as ch3 also so this is one proton and this is for three protons total four protons we can expect a five line pattern so in the left left uh, splitting it is corresponding to five lines with uh, corresponding intensity ratios and their coupling constants are 6.6 .6 and 6.6 .6. but in in the other possibility the coupling constants are different h1 h2 is different from h2 and ch3 so then the splitting pattern will be little complicated and they have uh, coupling constants of 5 heads and 6.6 .6 heads if they are more different here they are very close 5 and 6.6 .6. if they are more different like 3.8 and 6.6 .6, then splitting pattern will be even more uh, different when compared to second case so like this we come across in routine practice several different varieties of uh, splitting patterns corresponding to ch2 protons because uh, majority of times protons of ch2 are, uh, are not equivalent chemically not equivalent and sometimes magnetically also not equivalent so here uh, different possible combinations of splitting patterns are listed here earlier we looked at singlet doublet triplet quartet quintet and sextet these are very straightforward splitting patterns but uh, more complicated splitting patterns combinations of splittings doublet of doublet doublet of triplet doublet of doublet of doublet of doublet there are several lines see the whole splitting pattern is complicated so from this splitting pattern we can measure four splitting four coupling constants but we need to carefully calculate the coupling constants similarly here also triplet of doublet of doublet and like this there are several combinations of uh, splittings and also based on these coupling constant values also the type of uh, the appearance of splitting pattern will change suppose here in the first first column uh, fourth spectrum fourth one two three four five fifth example doublet of doublet of doublet of doublet four d's and uh, in the third column also there is uh, there is four d's uh, splitting pattern if you compare these two see they are uh, even though they are four d's the splitting pattern is different because their coupling constants are different similarly doublet of doublet of triplets or doublet of triplet of doublets we see uh, several varieties of uh, appearance of these splitting patterns so here we see an example we measure uh, coupling constant this is menthol molecule proton number of menthol where uh, we look at this uh, first carbon which is directly attached to oh so one can expect a higher chemical shift value for first carbon and corresponding uh, proton also there is one proton on this carbon so that proton is coming here which has a chemical shift value of uh, roughly 3.4 ppm because this one correspond to 3.4 ppm this is corresponding to proton on first carbon if you expand uh, that region it will look like this this is a doublet of a triplet so which has two couplings present in this particular splitting pattern one is like this this is 3j12 3j12 means it is a split, uh, coupling between uh, proton on first carbon and proton on second carbon so these two protons are three chemical bonds away from each other it has a coupling constants of uh, 3j12 what is the value it is uh, um, we will see and uh, second coupling is like this 3j16 proton on first carbon and proton on sixth carbon will have a coupling constant which have values like this 3j12 and 3j16 
and visually also you can see 3j12 is a smaller coupling and 3j16 is larger coupling similarly here is another uh, multiplet if you expand this this is corresponding to proton 7 proton on carbon 7 um, here also it is a doublet of a septet it is a seven line pattern each line of seven line further uh, split into doublet 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 doublets. 7 into 2, total 14 lines are observed. How 14 lines are observed? We will see here. The first coupling is uh, like this 3J72. 3J72 means uh, proton on carbon 7 and proton on carbon 2 are interacting with each other and uh, it will show up as a doublet. And the other coupling is 3 j7 8 plus 9 here uh, it is a chain terminus this is 9 is one methyl group and 8 is one methyl group as far as uh, proton 7 is concerned it will see 8 and 9 as a single entity since there are three protons on each carbon of 8 and 9 so total six protons so correspondingly a seven line pattern can be observed here it is a doublet and uh, corresponding to 8 and 9, it is 7 lines. Total, it is 14 lines. So, doublet. Since it is a small coupling, so we can show like this. And large coupling is 3J8 plus 9. Similarly, other couplings also can be measured. But uh, it is not very easy. Um, there are overlaps in this particular region, around 1 ppm. And uh, similar type of coupling constant can be observed in carbon deuterium between carbon and deuterium spins in cdcl3 uh, which is nothing but uh, chloroform whereas uh, h is replaced with deuterium so it becomes cdcl3 carbon is spin half and deuterium is spin one so now we can you can calculate how many how many number of lines can be expected for carbon if it is a proton then we can expect uh, carbon a doublet because uh, proton also has spin half. So this 2Ni plus 1 becomes N plus 1. So 1 proton plus 1, it becomes 2, 2 lines. Now it is looking like 3 protons of carbon. How 3 protons? Here uh, N plus 1 will not work because uh, deuterium spin is 1. So we have to use 2 n i plus 1. 2 into n is 1, i is 1 plus 1. So total it becomes 3. So we can expect 3 lines for this triplet of carbon. And accordingly, why this uh, triplet is having 1 is to 1 is to 1 intensity ratio. So again, we have to um, go through that. Uh, spin combinations, spin orientations, then accordingly this particular uh, uh, is getting 1 is to 1 is to 1 intensity ratio with a splitting coupling constant of 32 hertz. Okay, now it is uh, carbon 13 NMR spectrum of menthol. So same type of splitting explanation can be given here also. So menthol molecule um, will have 10 carbons. Uh, I think uh, I should have given structure here. Okay. So here it is menthol. And each carbon will have either one proton directly attached or two protons or three protons directly attached. So like that there are 10 carbons present in menthol molecule. So, if you take first carbon, it is having one proton directly attached. And CH2, 6, 4 and 3 are, are CH2 carbons. They are having two carbons directly attached to respective carbons. And one methyl here and two methyls 8 and 9 here. So, methyls are having three protons directly attached to carbon. So, we can expect for each carbon either a doublet or triplet or quartet. 
like that we are observing here this one particular doublet corresponding to ch which is having a coupling constant of 138 hertz similarly this triplet corresponding to a ch2 which is also having a coupling constant of 126 hertz and a quartet which is having a coupling constant of 124 hertz so like this a carbon proton coupled spectrum will look like this but in majority of times you may come across uh, a single line for each carbon but here i am showing doublets and triplets yeah, we will see what is that the top spectrum is uh, proton coupled carbon that is spectrum corresponding to butyric acid so there are two ch2s and one ch3 this is c is one ch2 triplet b is one ch2 triplet and a is a quartet so we can see all splittings very clearly because it is very small molecule if we remove this uh, carbon proton couplings then how to remove this carbon proton coupling there is a technique called decoupling decoupling is another uh, software program nothing to do with hardware it is a software program where uh, one can use a second radio frequency to um, remove this proton carbon couplings then each carbon will look like a singlet like this similarly for menthol also these doublets and triplets are uh, uh, couplings are removed so each doublet triplet and quartet will look like a single line so now we can measure chemical shift values we can measure number of carbons present in the molecule so there are 10 carbons present in uh, menthol molecule 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 okay. 10 carbons uh, matched this is the uh, final topic um, integration integration will give a rough estimation of uh, number of protons present in a particular uh, splitting pattern it is only an approximation so here is an example of uh, butyric acid ch3 ch2 coh now we can see this is oh corresponding to 1.05 and this is 1 ch2 this is 1 ch2 so uh, ch2 groups will have integration value of 2 and this is 1.96 and ch3 will have integration of 3 so this integration values are matching with the number of protons present in those particular proton groups so here 1.96 it is not 2 here it is 2.05 so as i said it is only an approximation qualitative approximation of number of protons so we cannot expect a pure number for each and every integration this is this one pure number which is given 3 to methyl group which is given manually with respect to this value all other values will be modified and this uh, value of 3 is only a user choice you can make this 3 as 30 or 300 or 1 we can make any number with respect to this number we can estimate the number of protons present on the other uh, signals also suppose we know this is corresponding to a methyl three protons if we make this as 30 then others will become 19.6 20.5 10.5 or if i make this as 1 so one correspond to three protons one integration correspond to three protons so then two protons correspond to an integration of 0.66 or 0.67 similarly one integration will become 0.33 like like that it is only a relative approximation but we need to identify one known signal with respect to that signal we can estimate the number of protons on the other side so it is like this uh, yeah as i said uh, this integration can be made 30 accordingly other integrations will be modified
but 30 corresponding to 3 protons. So corresponding to 20 correspond to 2 protons. So here I'll, here is a few examples. You can always uh, go through. Um, we look at carefully for this particular example. Um, now with your experience, with your experience of chemical shift, coupling constants and integration, you can say, you can assign what type of protons will have what chemical shift values. The first one is a triplet which is corresponding to 2.94. 2.94 is nothing but 3. And the second one is at 2, 2 ppm which is a singlet. It's a 3. And at 4.1 ppm it is 1.95. So it is corresponding to 2. Close to 2. So now we can say with respect to chemical environment electronic environment so which proton group will have higher chemical shift value that can be supported by its splitting pattern also now in this particular case i would say this uh, black ch2 is directly attached to oxygen so I, I would expect a higher chemical shift value corresponding to that ch2 so in this higher chemical shift value is 4.1 and also we have to support it with the coupling constant. So what type of splitting pattern can be observed for this CH2? Since it is directly attached to CH3, a quartet type of splitting pattern can be observed. So at 4.1, the according to electronic environment and also according to splitting pattern, it is matching with that particular CH2. Okay, then the next one is the singlet. It is very straightforward because blue color CH3 doesn't have any coupling partners. So you can expect a singlet uh, type of uh, pattern and also it is uh, attached to CO because it is not directly attached to in between oxygen and this proton C. That's why it is having less chemical shift value when compared to black CH2. So, Splitting wise and uh, chemical shift wise also it is matching with CH3 and integration also it is matching with three protons. And you are left with one CH3. CH3 is interacting with two, two protons. So you can expect a triplet and uh, its chemical shift value is low and uh, integration value also correspond to three protons. Like that we can easily assign two proton, three proton, three, pro three protons. OCH2 and CH3, blue CH3, this one and CH3, this one. Similarly, one can assign this also. I just skip these slides. I can give it to you for your uh, homework. New assignments are given here. This is also similar because uh, these are all uh, increasing uh, molecular weights. One, one CH2 group is increasing from the slides. So this is, uh, there is no oxygen but the CO is there. So now it is aromatic environment. Aromatic environment will have always higher chemical shift values because this is a whole aromatic all aromatic protons in electronic cloud. So based on their uh, um, electron cloud value uh, uh, orientation, the different protons will have different chemical shift values. So here in this particular case, CH3 anyway it is much simpler. It is a singlet and we are, for aromatic protons, there are five protons, but five protons are not equivalent. There are two orthoprotons, two metaprotons and one paraproton. And two metaprotons are having a higher chemical shift value because of uh, orientation of these electron uh, ring currents. Um, and then the paraproton, then metaprotons will have less chemical shift value out of all aromatic protons. 
so that is about uh, coupling constants chemical shift values coupling constants and spin spin coupling and integrations we have seen whatever is required for uh, assigning a simple nmr spectrum we have uh, looked at all these three parameters there are uh, few limitations for nmr because one major limitation is sensitivity that sensitivity can be improved with the number of nuclear spins how to improve number of nuclear spins it is in the form of concentration make more concentration then you will get more number of nuclear proton spins or carbon spins then that gives good sensitivity other one is uh, t2 relaxation time this is an inbuilt parameter that cannot be changed and number of scans number of scans means nothing but number of averages do the same experiment more and more times and add the resultant signal of all scans then you will get uh, good sensitivity and finally the external magnetic field increase the magnetic field then that also increases the sensitivity so with these parameters the sensitivity of an nmr spectrum can be improved there are few limitations of nmr spectrometers because one is uh, major thing is maintenance of nmr spectrometer it is towards uh, magnet um because superconducting magnets always require uh, periodic uh, uh, refilling of liquid helium and liquid nitrogen that is one major maintenance of nmr spectrometer and sensitivity and resolution can be improved because uh, in this case sensitivity can be improved with the help of uh, number of uh, spins concentration and t2 relaxation time number of averages and magnetic field in addition uh, in addition to magnetic fields and uh, number of uh, averages and other things there is improved hardware in the electronics improved electronics cryogenically cooled these are rf circuits there is uh, advanced technology rf circuits can be used dynamic nuclear polarization means uh, transferring polarization from abundant electron spins to nuclear spins this is a altogether a different technique and uh, its spectrometer also different and new nmr techniques in through software also through software programs also the um, sensitivity and resolution can be improved and interpretation of proton nmr spectrum suppose if you are given a, a NM, proton nmr spectrum then how to start where to start uh, then first of all you need to see how many number of signals present number of signals means number of uh, signal patterns you observe which indicates how many number of different kinds of proton groups present in the molecule positions of signals what is their chemical shift values based on the chemical shift values one can assume what type of uh, proton group it can be and the splitting of signals what type of splittings observed in each proton group signal is a triplet or multiplet multiplet like uh, doublet of a triplet doublet of doublet or triplet of doublet several combination indicates the number of interacting protons and finally integration this is uh, an approximation this is the first one to look into how many number of protons present in each signal so these are the four different parameters can be used um, in the interpretation of proton nmr spectra this is particularly applicable to proton nmr spectra for carbon nmr all you look into number of carbons present you can directly count the number of signals because each carbon is having one singlet so number of single signals corresponding to number of carbons and their position position of signals uh, will give the chemical shift information and their uh, um, environment in the molecule so these two position of signals 
and uh, number of signals. These first two are applicable to carbon also. The next two, they are absent for carbon. So these are a few examples uh, again given uh, um, for your uh, homework. So this is ethanol, ethanol 1 and 2, uh, it is easy. And uh, yeah, here uh, I want to highlight one thing, CH3, CH2, OH. In ethanol also there are two groups, CH3 and CH2. In ethyl bromide also there are two groups, ethyl and methyl and CH2. But their chemical shift values are different. Splitting patterns are same. Here, uh, here also you can observe one quartet and triplet. Whereas in ethanol also, we can observe one quartet and triplet. But their chemical shift values are different. See here in ethanol, the quartet chemical shift is around 3 and uh, triplet chemical shift is 1. Whereas in uh, ethyl bromide, the quartet chemical shift is 3.5 instead of 3 in ethanol. And... Uh, CH2 chemical shift is above 1.5. So this, this is basically the surrounding groups present. In ethanol, it is OH. Whereas in ethyl bromide, it is bromine. So that particular substitution attached group influences the chemical shifts of other protons. So A and B. pH 3 OH. This is also very simple. Only one CH3 and COOH anyway it, uh, chemical shift cannot be predicted and carbon 13 also you can observe two carbons one is uh, CH3 carbon at 20 ppm and uh, carboxylic acid carbon which is uh, a similarly similar to carbonyl carbon so it is at 180 ppm so acetone acetone is having only one carbon one proton because this is a symmetric molecule. So these two methyl groups are equivalent. So which is having only one chemical shift value. Whereas in carbon, there are two carbon chemical shifts. One is corresponding to these two CH3s. Other one correspond to this CO. So similarly, others. Um, so these are different applications of uh, NMR in pharmaceutical industry. Similar uh, things already shown in the first slide. So these are uh, proton NMR of a drug molecule, paracetamol. This is structure of uh, paracetamol. Where this is very small molecule. Um, at para position, OH is there. In the first position, it is NH, COCH3. So from Proton NMR spectrum itself, uh, one can easily assign the different car different protons. OH anyway, this is uh, around. <laughs> OH and NH chemical shift also. Here, these two are NH chemical shift around uh, 9 ppm and 9.5 ppm. These are OH and NH signals. And these two doublets are corresponding to ortho and meta because uh, two ortho protons are equivalent and two meta protons are equivalent and these two are corresponding to ortho and meta protons that's why the integration values also show up as two each and the one is left with, is left with. <laughs> hello? hello sir sorry for the interruption yeah, tell me. sir uh, actually we have a Okay, I, this is almost the end. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. This is last slide. Just I want to show this uh, NMR of this drug molecule. It's paracetamol and uh, its chemical shift values. And this is carbon 13 NMR of paracetamol. And this is uh, proton NMR of diclofenac. And this is carbon 13 NMR of diclofenac. That, that's the end. Thank you. Hello? Hello? It's audible, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That finishes my presentation. Hello? 
Halo? Halo? Halo, madam. Halo, sir. Ah, halo, madam. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sir, now I'm, can you able to hear my voice? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I finished my presentation. Hello? Sir, hello? Yeah, hello? tell me. Sir, can you hear me? I can hear you. Madam? Madam? Hmm. Sir? Sir? Madam, I can hear you. Okay, okay, okay. Sir, you have given an excellent lecture on NMR spectroscopy. It's up principles and applications, the chemical shifts, spins in coupling and all. Uh, students are very much benefited by you, your lecture. Yeah, I, I hope. Thank you very much for giving an elaborative lecture. It is very interesting also. Okay, it's my pleasure. Okay, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much, sir. Much, sir. sir, now there is a vote of thanks. Before telling about the vote of thanks, I would like to inform to the, all the audience that feedback forms will be given to you now. You have to give, uh, you have to fill the feedback forms. Then only you will be given e certificates. All the audience. Sir, now there is a vote of thanks after your lecture. Okay. Please wait for five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Hello, hello, madam. Hello. Respected dignitaries, research scholars, students, good afternoon. Hello. On behalf of AU College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Andhra University, and its entire faculty, the vote of thanks to all dignitaries. I would like to express my gratitude Hello. to all the same daily opinions of this national on the topic. Recent trends in drug discovery, Aroscopy and Computational Tools 2022. For this, hello, madam. Trends and contribution to Professor at Naipur Mohali for making us explore about developing new strategies using artificial intelligence in drug discovery. I would like to express my deep regards to Dr. Akela V.S. Sharma, sir, principal scientist at CSIR IICT Hyderabad, for spreading the knowledge and making us understand the basic principles of NMR spectroscopy. I extend my gratitude to our Chief Pattern of the Webinar, Professor P. V. G. D. Prasad Reddy, Sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Andhra University, for inspiring, encouraging, and supporting us continuously to excel in the field of education. I would like to further extend my hearty thanks to the organizing committee members and faculty members for being the backbone for organizing this national webinar and making it successful in a very short span of time. Pattern of the Webinar, Professor K. Samata, Madam. Rector, Andhra University. Patron, Professor V. Krishna Mohan, sir. Registrar, Andhra University. Professor Y. Rajendra Prasad, sir. Principal, AU Corp, Andhra University. President of the webinar, Professor G. Girija Shankar, sir. In charge, Principal, AU Corp, Andhra Convener, Professor V. Girija Shastri, madam. Professor, AU Corp, Andhra University. Co-convener, Dr. M. Murli Krishna Kumar, sir. Associate Professor, AU Corp, Andhra University. At last, but not the least, my deep sense of thanks and appreciation goes to all the participants who were live with us and attended the webinar with great enthusiasm and made it a great success. Once again, I would like to extend my hearty thanks to everyone and would like to thank for giving me this opportunity to propose a word of thanks. Hello, madam. So thank you very much. Now the session.
ends the session ends, ends today session ends. hello madam that uh, feedback form is not that my student is open and the camera hello hello madam excuse me sir hello uh, what about the feedback form madam when I, we have to fill the feedback form tomorrow end of the session or today end of the session today today sir uh, where, where, where can i get the feedback form we had uh, attached in chat box sir let's see that uh, chat box uh, not it's not opening madam feedback form No, ma'am, it's not working. It's working. It's not there. So, what else no, is it? No, actually, feedback link is there, ma'am, but it's not opening. Just wait for one minute, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Only starting, na. Madam, can I leave? Hello, madam. One second, madam, please. Back phone. The chat box is missing. Please opening or not? It's working, sir. Hello. 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 One second, sir. Petan, ma'am. Petan, sir. Hello, madam. So it is asking the permission. The next link also. Can you please check it out? Hello, Hello madam. It is. Hello. We will send it to through mail. Hello, madam. Ah, uh, Vali Devi, madam. Achyuta. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, madam, can I get the feedback form through mail? Ah. Yes, sir. Actually, it is not opening in the uh, chat box. Opening it is sent, sir. Ah, uh, mail through mail you can send. Um. Sorry for your confusion. Is there any doubt, sir? Sorry for inconvenience for all. This people. Permission only. 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 Permission only.